Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to Something to Wrestle with Bruce Pritchard. Bruce, what's going on, man? How are you? <laughs> well, I'm better than I have been, but I'm still on the mend, man. I feel like my, my teeth are just hanging on. They're loose. They're not, but they're, uh, they're just hanging on, and I'm getting through it, but I'm a lot better than I was even just uh, two days ago. My God, I'm wonderful. Well, we're glad you're back with us amongst the living. We had uh, two shows, not one, but two shows that we dropped last week, a surprise episode, King of the ring 94, which we hope to do the prior week, but your dental surgery prevented that. So we played a best of, but we did our best to over deliver last week when we covered King of the ring 94 and King of the ring 99. I got great feedback from both shows. Uh, but people really love Bruce on pills on the King of the ring 94 episode. <laughs> Nobody ever loved me on pills, man. What the hell? What, what was the feedback you got from King of the Ring 94 and 99? That I should take more painkillers? Yeah, it's wild, man. I think <laughs> we got to get what? you. Should off. I take one right now? Yes, come on. Should I take one right now? Take it, take it, take I feel like this is the click in 95. Take it, take it, take it. Uh-oh. That's the old wrestler mating call. I hear it. Well, it is time to take my pills, so I'll take my pills. Now, we're going to do something different for you today. We've never done this, Bruce. And even when we uh, we connected today, you said, now, what are we doing here? How are we going to do this? We're going to sit down and we're going to watch one of the biggest nitros ever. It happened 21 years ago tomorrow. It's July 6th, 1998. It's nitro in the Georgia Dome, and Goldberg is going to beat Hulk Hogan in the main event. Sorry for the spoiler there, Bruce. This is the biggest nitro ever. You Are, told me last week, do not watch this. I did. I didn't watch it. And now you're telling me the finish. Yeah. Sorry, I, buddy, man. I know you're let down, but you won't be disappointed in this show. This is going to be fun. and something unlike anything we've ever done. Instead of getting a lot of different insight into the goings on of the company that we're watching at the time, which is normally what we do with a watch along. Instead, we're going to get Bruce's opinion on what's going on in WCW. And we will do a little bit of compare and contrast with what's happening on the WWE show as well. So fire up your WWE network right now, go to the vault, find Monday nitro, and then I want you to find episode number 147. If you're going to search by years, of course, you'll start with 1998, go to July. It's July 6th, nitro number 147. Get that disclaimer out of the way up front. And then when you're at all triple zeros, you're going to hit mute and press play with us. When we give you the countdown, Bruce, tell them how you're going to do the countdown today. Okay. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go nine, five, three. No, we're going to go three, two, one play. When I say play, that's when you hit the button. So I'll say three, two, one play. And the next time I say that little phrase, we're going to be ready to rock and roll. I like that. You started to do a countdown and you were already, those pills were already taking their effect. You're like nine, five, three. So yeah, let's go ahead and do the real countdown. Hopefully you're with us. It's Monday nitro from July 6th, 1998 nitro number 147 on the WW network hit mute. You might want to throw your closed captioning on if you got it. And, uh, when Bruce says play hit play. All right, guys, here we go. Three, two, one play. So we're starting out here with the prior thunder. So this took place just four days ago, live on thunder. Tony Schiavone and his double breast. Who's the suit. fat guy on the right? Yeah, that's Tony Schiavone ate himself. Oh, okay. And this is uh, James J. Dillon, who has looked 50 years old for 50 years. JJ looked like he was 60 when he started in the business. It's amazing. There's a certain group of guys who just seemingly don't age. I think Arn Anderson's one of them. JJ Dillon's another. Like those guys just always look like they're like 45 years old. So why, why are we looking at JJ in a close up shot and, and him talking to us to start off this monumental show? I'm glad you asked. So they announced the main event for the Georgia dome as being Goldberg after 106 victories, undefeated, whatever the number is, and he's going to get a shot at the world title. And it's been determined by WCW because he's the WCW commissioner. He's acting commissioner. He's the boss of WCW on screen. So he's making this match four days ahead of time. This is the first time they announced it. So when nitro left the air the prior week, no, no such match existed. 
we knew that the nitro show was going to happen at the Georgia dome. And we knew that ticket sales were strong, but we didn't have a match. Now we've got a match and it's going to be going head to head with a taped draw. So they're pulling out all the stops. When you first heard they're doing Goldberg and Hulk Hogan, I don't want to put words in your mouth. What'd you think? Hot shot. Yeah. I thought Hot you were shot desperation. That. Now it's important to mention nitro had been dominating up until 1998. And we've covered this in the archives. The first time raw beats nitro is in April of 98 with, with Vince McMahon and Steve Austin on top. Uh, and now it's very much a ratings war. It's back and forth. Hey, what do you think of this open for nitro, the nitro girls, the pyro you're a, you're a production guy. What do you think? I always liked the nitro girls. I thought they added a little, little bit of glitz and glamor to the show. And quite frankly, I'd rather watch the nitro girls most nights than some of the matches they had on. What did Vince think of the nitro girl concept? Was he for it or against it? Well, we had done it in different incarnations with, you know, we had raw girls right. when raw started a long time ago. We had tried some different things. The Federettes going back into the eighties and so on and so forth. So it was, it was an interesting concept, but it was also something that we didn't want to do because we felt that it was a little bit, God, another 15, uh, people to travel around the country and more expense. But, uh, I think it was a nice little break because they, they sure as hell couldn't fill all their time with wrestling as much time as they had. So put some beautiful young ladies out there for guys to take a look at and, the Nitro girls were not hard to look at. They were not. Uh, this was uh, Tony Schiavone's favorite part of the show for sure. And check out in the middle in the back row there. That's uh, Shawn Michaels' bride now. All right. Is Charmel in here yet? No, I don't think she's in there. Um, we got Che on the left. Of course, DDP's wife, Kimberly, up front, standing right next to Shawn Michaels' wife now. She's Whisper here is her, her dance name. So here we are a big shot of the Georgia dome. Um, this was uh, a major, major show. And the, uh, Tony Schiavone not only got all dressed up and put on a tuxedo, he made sure his chair was about eight inches taller than everyone else's. Well, you know what? And here we thought Tony was not that bright. Look at that. He's standing right up in the middle. It's nothing. No, I think Tony's standing and the rest of them are sitting. That's what it is. I want to assure you if, if his chair, if he is seated. And we, we see how much taller his chair is than everybody else. You know, his feet are just dangling. Wee, wee, wee. You know. <laughs> like horse swoggle off the edge of the chair. <laughs> He's just a little dangling out there. Dee, 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 dee. He hey. didn't know what the fuck to do with his hands either. He's always got the hand thing going too. He's almost as bad as I am. What do you think about, um, you watch nitro here and there. Maybe you didn't watch a full show all the way through very often, but. What, what did you think of Larry Zabisco as a commentator for WCW? Always liked Larry Zabisco, as a matter of fact, and tried to hire Larry a couple of different times, but Larry had a great gig where he was, and I don't know if there was bad blood over the years between Larry and Vince for whatever reason. God, everybody's got something they want to complain and bitch about at some point. But I liked Larry's work because he was different, and Larry had come from that Bobby Heenan school of heel commentary where he knew how to get people over. And now Mike, I don't know what Mike today's pissed off about. I love Mike today personally. And I think Mike today's great storyteller. I always used to tell him, why are you so pissed off <laughs> when you're on the air? He's just like, it's my face, Bruce. Yeah. I mean, I, I get that. He does have a scowl, but it, I always took it because he was just, he was being very serious. I mean, he took his role very seriously. He was not there for the funny, ha ha all for information. And what a, what a way to start the show here. We got Hulk Hogan strutting out playing air guitar. How hot was the NWO in 1998? I realized that, you know, some people would argue that creatively their best years were 96 or 97. But you're still seeing a ton of NWO shirts show up at WWE events in 98. Are you not? I think they were everywhere. You know, you'd go through Spencer's gifts in the mall. They were there. So the NWO was, man, they were riding that wave. But I do believe, I really do believe at this time that I, th I think they were on the decline. I think they had had, they, they had that run it was, and it was a great run. 
but it was kind of on the downward side here a little bit because I think people were getting a lot of the same, same. They had seen it, and we were trying to do something different and new on the other side to combat it. But one thing you can't take away, friggin' Hogan always looked great. Yeah, I mean, this is something that uh, I've been looking forward to talking about with you. Two things, I guess. Number one, uh, the belt being spray-painted. That's uh, sacrilege to an old-school guy like you. When you first saw or heard that they had put spray paint on the big gold belt that you remember being around the waist of Ric Flair or Dusty Rhodes or Ricky Steamboat, what did you think? Great heat, but yes, sacrilege, man. That was, come on. You don't do that. You can't go there. Who's the goof talking now? I think he is uh, running SmackDown for Fox. I don't know. (laughs) So what a, what a weird turn of events we've got, you know, who would have ever thought, you know, all these years later, Brutus would be in the hall of fame (laughs) and, uh, Hulk Hogan would play hokey pokey with the hall of fame and Liz wouldn't be with us. And somehow. Eric Bischoff would be running a show on a major broadcast television station for the WWF, a show that doesn't even exist at this point. SmackDown. Here, here, here's the fun. Yeah. Here, and here's the, the other funny thing is, is, you know, during this time where we just looked at our competition as the antichrist that I had met Eric Bischoff one time when he came through for a cup of coffee and tried to sell me a broom. Um, that he would be one of my best friends today. <laughs> so <laughs> that's kind of ironic. And that, you know, I'm walking through airports and, and getting, you know, calls from HH again, just, you know, to talk and BS. So that, that's a lot of fun as well. And it's, it's amazing how as time goes on, the more things change, the more they stay the same. And what in the hell is beefcake? Beefcake looks great back there, but what's he doing? Uh, his gimmick is he's the disciple and, uh, I think his, uh, his, that's his official title. He's the icicle, uh, disciple disciple. Yeah. Of what? Exactly. All right. I think he, uh, I think he might be the unofficial weed carrier for Hulk Hogan here. I don't know for sure. Let's talk about the, the impact of Hulk Hogan. You know, Hulk Hogan was obviously running wild when, when you first come to, work for Vince McMahon on the heels of WrestleMania three. There's no bigger star, not just then in wrestling, but in the history of wrestling. And then we would see over the course of the next, I don't know, six or seven years that starts to taper a little bit. Did you ever think Hogan had a second act in him and it would be as a monster heel like this? I mean, it, it, it almost, I mean, I think you could argue and I know you will argue it, but what he did for the WWF, he's going to do for WCW here. I agree with that. I wholeheartedly agree that Hulk Hogan, that, that star power and the man behind Hulk Hogan, he did. And he did it in a completely different character off of his other character, off of that strong baby face character. Sure. But I did believe that Hulk Hogan had a heel run. And at the time that Hogan left, I strongly believed that we should have turned Hulk Hogan heel in the WWE. What would that have looked like? Just let's just go down that rabbit hole for a minute. Hypothetically had Hogan turned heel and turned his back on all his little Hulkamaniacs on Vince's watch, who would his opponents have been? What would have been a, a for instance angle to pull that off? Oh my gosh. I think that everybody that he had worked with before, you could almost switch baby face and do the same type, do the exact same thing in reverse. And Here's how crazy in in my head, how my head would work sometimes was Hulk would always talk about the yellow and red and take your vitamins. And so we'll we'll just turn him instead of yellow and red, he'll be red and yellow and reverse everything. (laughs) Like, like, Like bizarro Superman, like bizarro Superman. Exactly. And you know, he had the entire roster to work with. He could have had the entire roster to work with heels, baby faces, everything. If he had just adopted that little bit different attitude and everything. However, there was a different business strategy between 
how we ran our business and how everybody else has ever run their business because we looked at it as business. We looked at it as marketing. We looked at it as merchandising. We looked at it in every other avenue. All those other buckets had to be taken care of. And Hulk Hogan, as Hulk Hogan, man, th there was nobody bigger, nobody stronger at the time that you didn't want to upset that apple cart. Yeah, I totally get why you don't want to leave money on the table. I mean, if it's, it's the old adage, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I should mention that, uh, even though the, the main event has been announced by WCW, the purpose of this Hogan promo is he's coming out here saying the only way Goldberg is going to get a shot tonight at the title with me, brah, is if he runs through another NWO brother that you guys haven't seen for a while. And if he can manage to beat him, then I'll give Goldberg the shot. But if he loses, that's it. No shot for Goldberg. You know, you haven't quite earned your stripes just yet. So they don't announce who the opponent is just that Goldberg is going to have to win a match and in, in order to make it to the main event for the world title. So we're pretty much guaranteed two Goldberg appearances tonight. What a different era to look at this crowd and see all these signs. I, I feel like fans express themselves on social media now and signs are sort of hit or miss as one of the fans who once upon a time was behind some of those signs. I'm glad they're gone. Look at that cosplay. Look at Hulkster. Do you miss, yeah. do you miss signs? I do to a point. Uh, I, I love seeing them in the open. I love looking out at that sea, that audience and see that sea of signs. What I don't miss is the people with the signs up all night long. It becomes distracting and it really does for the viewer at home, but even more so for the live event, the people in the arena oh. that are just like, God, put your side down. We seen it. We saw it. So yeah. Who's this guy working with? Uh, so we're getting lots of crowd reactions, you know, Hey, what do you think's going to happen tonight? Hey, let's talk about the business side of this. We see Valvoline sin power is uh, promoting nitro. They're a sponsor here on the show. And we're going to see a little skit in a minute. Uh, and this was always a, a fun little piece of business. We'll come back to the sponsorship for a minute. You know, you like the production aspect of the business, the television aspect. What do you think of these? Hey, we're going to make them NWO, uh, commercials and we're going to sort of shoot it at an angle and it's going to be all black and white. And we're going to put this effect over it. That way it looks like the NWO has paid for the time to be on the show. Cause they're not technically part of WCW nice touch or overkill. What say you? Well, I thought it was great touch. I thought so too. I thought, because it makes you think that they're doing it on their own. And if you're into the NWO, then you love it. Yeah. And if you're not, you don't have to support it. I, I gotta tell you, I was expecting you to shit on more stuff here. Here's what we were talking about. The, uh, Valvoline, uh, sin power. They're going to give away this car and this, this guy here from somewhere in Arkansas, uh, he's countryer than a tater, uh, th this guy here, he won a car before. And so mean jeans like, Hey, do you get that thing out on the road? By the way, that does not look street legal, but that's a real NASCAR that they're giving away here. How do those deals like that come together? I know you didn't put this deal together, but you guys had some similar giveaways and prizes and things like that with WCW. Does the sales team pitch that or do those. So their reps come to y'all. It works both ways. Sometimes reps will come to us just looking for the publicity and what they will offer up is they'll offer up the grand prize to give away plus some other cash, but it's all promotion for them. So it's not something we're going to go out and say, Hey, let's go buy a NASCAR and give it away. No, that's NASCAR and whoever else, uh, whether it's Valvoline or the sponsor that is paying for all of that in that regard. I don't know. Gene doesn't look like that much of a country hick. Oh no. I didn't mean him. I mean, this guy, he makes me look, uh, urban. So the, uh, the, the Valvoline gimmick though, I mean, what do you, I know you're not there. If somebody said, Hey, we want to sponsor a raw in 1998. We want to do a little segment. We want to do a giveaway. You guys, you know, mention us a few times and, you know, going into commercial or coming out or throw a replay to us and then we'll give away a car, make it a big to do. What do you think that would have cost back in the day? Gee, sometimes it may have just cost, you know, the, the cost of what the giveaway prize is. And sometimes I God, I have no idea what the advertising rates were back at that time, but they're going to pay for advertising rates. Sure. So here we got, uh, Dean Malenko coming to the ring. He's been 
And a bit Did you feud. notice Linda uh, Hogan in the front row she, earlier? Absolutely. She's there. I think yeah. she's got the kids in tow with her too. Sure did. And you know, the, I, your boy Meltzer would, would, would be very critical of, um, Hogan in this era and just all the politicking quote unquote, we'll get into that in a minute, but here's Booker T as the TV champion. When did you know that Booker T was money? Oh boy. When I, I'll let me, let me back up. Sound did, funny. You, did you see him in global or did, did you, are you your first piece of business where you see Booker T is it with Harlem heat in WCW or did you see him in global? Very first, the, my last night in global was the night that Booker T and Stevie Ray came in to meet with Eddie Gilbert. That's cool. And I remember looking at them going, who in the hell is that? Because they were dressed to the nines. Uh, they looked like somebody, Yep. but I didn't know who they were. Both real nice guys just coming in, looking for an opportunity. But the first time that I really sat up and took notice was when, Sherry Martell, uh, began to manage Harlem heat. And I went, wow, there's something there. So w- what was it about the combination with, with them and Sherry that stuck out to you? I just think that they had chemistry and they were, they, they felt like a unit. There was no, it, it, it didn't feel phony. It didn't feel like, okay, we're going to stick Sherry with these guys. She'll be the manager. It felt like this was a threesome that was a unit that worked really well together. And you just looked at the way that they worked. Booker worked different. You just looked at the little ways that he hits the ropes and how he comes off of the ropes. Booker T worked differently than other people. And back in the day when they were a team, I think most people were looking at Nash. They were looking at, uh, I'm I'm sorry. um, Yeah, we which they call him Nash, but, uh, looking at Stevie going, wow, that's going to be the star because of his size. Sure. And you forget Booker's a good size, man. <laughs> B- Booker is a, a mu- deceptively large. I mean, this in person, there's only a handful of guys I've met where I'm like, God damn, they're a lot bigger than I remember. And it's Booker T and Billy Gunn. That's the list. Yes. B- both of those guys, I think. As a fan, I had an expectation they were, I don't know, six, one, six, two. They're not. I mean, if you drew a, a professional wrestler, he would look like Booker T. I mean, he has a wrestler physique, a wrestler. Look, this is, he is a professional wrestler. If he drew one. Absolutely. And he had the fire and he had the fire and desire. If you will, the big cat and the lad would have been talking about the man had fire. The man had a little desire going to take him a long way. He's not stealing money. Every time he goes to the bank. In there with Dean Malenko, um, when, when was Dean Malenko first on your radar? Did you guys see any of his stuff, uh, abroad, any of his stuff in Mexico, any of his stuff in ECW, or when were you first familiar with him as a, as a wrestler? I know that, you know, he, he, uh, I guess was like a witness for you guys in the whole Chuck Austin lawsuit, uh, and would come in there as like an expert witness and explain the way the move could be executed. I found that interesting as a little footnote, but. He doesn't really get a shot with y'all. Was Vince down on him because he wasn't tall enough? I'm not saying that to be silly, but there had to be something, right? Well, Dean, uh, for me, when I first became familiar with Dean Malenko was when he first started. And the reason being is I was such a fan of his father. Uh, Boris Malenko was the first great heel I remember as a kid in Houston, Texas. And he had this tremendous rivalry with Wahoo McDaniel. So the name Malenko, I would always watch because it was in respect to his father. And I, I don't think I really remember Dean until WCW watching him and seeing anything him on him in a regular basis. So here we see a, uh, a, a newly healed Chris Jericho. Jericho has been the uh, white meat baby face number 47 for a while here on WCW, but he's going to flip out on Dave Penzer. And one thing leads to another, and now he's a bad guy. And he is in the middle of a phenomenal run here in 1998. This is my favorite Chris Jericho. When did you, you know, we know he's going to have a big debut, uh, about a year later, um, for you guys on the other channel. And he just cost Dean Malenko there, but he's even got like an airbrush shirt here. Monday night Jericho. That's going to 
get over to the point WCW produces the shirt. It feels like anything that Jericho had going for him. He sort of willed into existence here rather than waiting for it to be handed down. And that's probably something that's going to serve him well throughout the rest of his wrestling career. When was he on your radar? I mean, was there an option or a consideration of doing something with him before he sort of made hay in WCW or does it happen here? No, it, it, there was consideration back when Jericho and Lance storm were in smoky mountain wrestling with Jim Cornette, just looking at them, but they were both really, really green at the time. And even Cornette was telling us they're not ready. So we kind of passed on them at the time, but we had our eye on Chris back then. And, uh, Chris was one of those unique talents, man, that just kind of had it. And he had a hell of a personality. So we've got a promo here, pre-tape from Carl Malone and, um, the backstory, uh, to this whole celebrity usage in professional wrestling is Mike Tyson, uh, pops up on Monday night raw and does huge business for you guys. Eric Bischoff tells the story that when Zane Breslov called him and told him, Hey, they got Mike Tyson, Eric knew, oh no, we're in trouble. Uh, so he starts looking to see, Hey, what can we do? And as luck would have it. The whole Dennis Rodman thing that they did in 97, he's still hot and in the news. And now he's in the, going to be in the finals against Carl Malone and Carl Malone, uh, sees diamond Dallas page at a basketball game, throws up the diamond cutter. They meet. And one thing leads to another Dennis Rodman is, is someone who has roots in WCW and an existing relationship. So DDP allegedly approaches Eric and says, Hey man, what if we tried to do something with Malone? against Rodman and, you know, we did like a tag match. And of course that's going to be what's happening six days from here on one side. It'll be Hulk Hogan tagging up at bash at the beach with Dennis Rodman to take on Carl Malone and diamond Dallas page. And it's going to do huge numbers. One of the best buy rates in WCW history, tons of mainstream interest. And it doesn't hurt that the NBA finals that year had both of those guys against each other, not just on opposite teams, but they played the exact same position. They're both power forwards. So these guys are are getting into it on the court and now they're going to settle their differences in the wrestling ring. When you hear that, that's the plan. What's, what's the reaction from the WWF? Not much. Uh, and especially for me, because I'm not a basketball fan, but there really wasn't a whole lot. It, It seemed kind of okay. Then what? Because there wasn't. We didn't know what the integration was going to be and everything else. Conrad, I, I got. I, I'm sorry. I have. I, I'm. You got can, a Canyon and Raven and whoever else. This is a holiday weekend, right? Yeah. Okay. So this. Uh, okay. Oh, there we go. Woo. So wait. So a Canyon Raven match is taking you to drinking. <sighs> yeah. My gosh, both of these guys were in and out with you. Uh, talk to me a little bit about Canyon. Why don't you think Canyon became a bigger star when, when you just look at his in-ring work and some of his innovation and some of the unique moves that he created, there was a, uh, you know, an underground fan base for Canyon online, uh, that were just super fans of his, but for whatever reason, it never really happened for him on camera. Of course. We see he, he came to the ring holding the mortis mask, which was his first WCW gimmick. When he takes the mask off, the work's still the same, but I think a lot of the allure from the, the office in WCW was down until, um, DDP would campaign for him to be a part of the Jersey triad. And then he at least had a spot, but he never really achieved the top guy status. What was it about Canyon that was just off? I don't think that Canyon Canyon played whatever part he was in the ring. Canyon never became that part. I thought Canyon had a good look. Uh, I thought he could work. Yeah. His work was decent, but that personality and connection with the audience, for me, I never saw it. And it always looked like he was just playing a part and not being whatever the hell he wanted to be. You add into that his communication skills were not good, and maybe that was because of the lisp. But we know that there have been people in this industry with a lisp who accentuated that damn thing and made millions of dollars and become some of the most iconic uh, 
in the world ever. Like Dusty Rhodes. About funky like a monkey, baby. Like Ric Flair. I mean, all those guys. Yeah. And it just, there, there was not a, there wasn't a clear cut connection with Canyon. He was just Canyon. And no one really understood what that was. Of course we lost Canyon. Um, and, and he wrote a book, uh, which I would recommend if you've never read it, it is a, a very good book on wrestling. He grew up a big wrestling fan and he struggled with, um, sort of being comfortable with his sexuality and, and the professional wrestling world. And, uh, that's a shame that, that he's no longer with us. And I can't help, but think that if Canyon were still around, just based on, you know, his reputation as a worker, he would have been a contributor in today's wrestling world, whether it's with ring of honor or impact or new Japan or AEW or WWE. I mean, he'd be working somewhere if he was with us. And it's a shame that he's not here to see it and partake. Yeah. I think Kanye would have been a great trainer and someone that could teach people how to do what it is that they do. But I'm, this he table just had was, a hard time communicating with himself. This table was about to whip Perry Saturn's ass. I'm getting it out. Yeah. All, damn near already, almost already did. <laughs> Is that thing sawed in half? No, surely not. It's not going to break. It's already scored. It's not going to break right there, is it? I hope not. Come on. So, um, of course, Perry Saturn, former member of the flock, and uh, he wants to be free from the flock and be his own man. So he's trying to take it out on Raven here. So this match is going to end in a DQ. Hey, it didn't break right well, there. Maybe it wasn't. A score. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's that... a stiff fucking table right there, folks. Where's Matthew when you need him? Damn. This, so, uh, Perry Saturn, Ra- Raven Canyon sort of rank them as far as, you know, what you perceive there as a talent scout, where you would rank them. If you were, if you're starting a wrestling promotion, these are three talents that are available to you. You got to do a pecking order, a batting order, if you will. What's that look like with these three? Oh shit. I'm going after Saturn. Yep. Then I'm good. I thought you would say that. I thought you were really high on Saturn for whatever reason. This is unfortunate here. We're going to see buff Bagwell get out in a wheelchair. Um, and there's Judy tag team champion herself. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Raven though. What about Raven? Um, Eric Bischoff has been pretty open and honest on 83 weeks saying he didn't get it. He he doesn't understand why Raven was a thing. He didn't get the character. Uh, he just wasn't a fan, but I feel like you probably got the character Canyon better than Eric. what do you think of the Raven character? The original Raven character that was in WCW with the vignettes with Raven in the park swinging. I absolutely loved, and I thought that, wow, man, Scotty's got something here, but then it became nonsensical and, and lost, but it was lost to the point of no one caring. That's my opinion. I I just thought that the things that Scotty did as Raven in ECW early on in the creation of that character and the transformation was fucking awesome, but then they lost it. They lost it quickly. Once he left ECW. Yeah. The ECW stuff is worth going out of your way to see. It's, uh, you know, my wrestling buddy Cliff from Hershey. It's his favorite wrestling character. So when I heard uh, Cliff on Hershey, I, I really like the way, but I would like to join the flock. Unofficially, I have a card that I made up where I'm a member of the flock. Thank you for doing that for me. Um, uh, Lots of intrigue about this show. You can see how excited fans are. The Goldberg phenomenon is something we're going to talk about here, and we've got plenty of time to discuss it, but this decision to make it the main event seemingly comes as a reaction when the rating comes in, because you saw they announced it on thunder and that was Thursday thunder. So, you know, when that rating comes down on Tuesday, they probably call an audible and. Allegedly the call comes from Hulk Hogan, uh, when he calls and pitches it to Eric, and we'll talk about that, but the raw that sort of spurned this and made it happen is the one after the King of the ring. And of course, King of the ring 98 is famously where Mick Foley came flying off the cage. Stone cold lost the first blood match and the world title to Kane. He wins it back the next night on raw. And that does a huge rating. 
a 5.3 nitro only got a 4.05, uh, but it is a huge, huge record when you combine them because you're talking about 6.9 million homes watching wrestling that weekend. Um, you have sort of always agreed with Eric that there's probably not 6.9 million people. Some of those folks are going back and forth and being counted twice. Would you agree? I do agree a hundred percent. So we see footage here of the nitro party. This was a, a fun gimmick where, you know, if you submit your tape of your nitro party, they're going to send folks from WCW to your house or wherever your party location is to celebrate. And they were getting tapes from all over. I love, they still have this up here and they're not blurring it out. That's fun. How so. many did you send in? I didn't send in any, but, uh, our great friend of the show, Cassio kid did send one. And did he, they come to his house? They, he didn't get, he didn't win, but he told me that what he did is he had like the nitro logo painted on some blinds or something like that. And they would like, I don't know. They used it as a gimmick. We'll have him and Judy recreate it one day, but yeah, the nitro party concept where you're sending in tapes that feels very Vince McMahon. Like, what do you think of that promotion? Well, I think that we had actually done that promotion (laughs) prior to them doing it. And it just became an expensive proposition with the live satellites and doing some different things. We, we did do something similar where we would go out and try and recreate some of those things, but just became cost prohibitive for what you were going to get on the other side. So I applaud them for uh, getting out there and doing what they can to drum up business. And they were going to college campuses, which was, again, man, you're going for the demo that you are that you want to play to. You're going for that fucking 18 to 24-year-old that you want coming out to your shows. The uh, other thing that's making the news is the relationship with the tonight show and WCW. They actually have, you know, some guys from WCW Hulk Hogan and Eric Bischoff invade the tonight show set. And then on nitro, they recreate the tonight show set and they call it like NWO late night. And Eric Bischoff is the host, uh, that dies. And, uh, Meltzer will say it, uh, bombed royally and ranked as one of the worst segments ever on a nitro. And it only did a 3.4 rating. I mean, that seems like a really great thing that wrestling would normally pursue, you know, a relationship with the tonight show that feels like something money couldn't buy and out of the reach of wrestling. But now that WCW has it somehow they're managing to use it in a way where it hurts the rating. Uh, What's your reaction to that news? I thought it was absolutely God awful. I thought it was one of the worst things that, um, one of the worst things that I, that I'd ever seen on TV. It just was not good. It was bad television and boring television. Worse, worse than bad TV is boring TV. So Uh, here you see the, uh, the week prior also on that show, besides the NWO skit, uh, you see Carl Malone who uh, drove an 18 wheeler here for some reason end of the show with diamond Dallas page. And this is how we're going to sort of set the stage for our pay-per-view. That's going to happen six days from today's show. And this nitro would it, would it surprise you to hear, I guess I should ask this. How well do you know Dennis Rodman? I, I don't know Dennis Rodman. Have you ever met him at all? I've met Dennis. Yes, but I've never hung out with Dennis. He no showed this raw at the, or this <laughs> force of habit, this nitro at the Georgia dome. He's supposed to be here to promote the big show and, uh, you know, it's, it's his pay-per-view main event as part of his, his payday and his compensation package. And he doesn't make it, uh, now the night before, or perhaps two nights before, uh, he's on stage barefoot and hammered uh, at a Pearl jam concert, but nowhere to be found here on this show. So we won't be seeing any Dennis Rodman appearances to build up this match, this tag team match. This week on pay-per-view surprising to hear that Dennis Rodman no showed. No, it, it really wasn't because you heard all of those rumors about how unpredictable Rodman was at the time. And Hey, you get what you pay for. We, you know, we heard the same don't do business with Mike Tyson. Well, we made sure that we had people with Mike Tyson at all times to make sure Mike was going to be where he needed to be 
when he needed to be there. That's the difference. Of course, we're about to get the big intro here, um, for diamond Dallas page. Talk to me a little bit about DDP in the WWE. You know, he, I think most fans know that he drove the Cadillac to the ring at WrestleMania six for rhythm and blues. He winds up popping up, uh, in a few different spots, the AWA, the Florida territory, and then he gets his break in WCW as a manager decides to become a wrestler at like 35 years old and now has willed himself into a good spot here. Some people would be critical and say, oh, it's just because he was neighbors and boys with Eric Bischoff and he was relentless and just positioned himself in a good spot. Others would say, no, his, his in-ring work, uh, is all him. He worked at it. He honed his craft. And when his feud with Macho Man happened in 97, he proved that he could hang. What was your opinion at the time of Diamond Dallas Page being in this spot? Well, because my time with with DDP goes all the way back to the late 80s uh, through Dusty Rhodes. And Dusty was obviously a huge fan of DDP. And Dallas was always looking for something. Dusty was always looking for something for Dallas. And we tried him out several times as a color commentator. Didn't work. But I always liked Dallas. And the reason I always liked Dallas because because he was a hustler. He never <laughs> I don't know that Dallas sleeps because he's always thinking about the next thing. He's always thinking about different ways to make money, different ways to reinvent himself. So when you hear about him, he's gonna wrestle. I think a lot of the guys that have known him for a while are saying, Dallas, you're thirty five years old. You, this is a pipe dream stick with the managing, stick with what you're doing. And Dallas took all of that negativity and turned it into positivity. And what the, the bullshit about DDP being Eric's neighbor years later, I I've heard from both sides and that worked against Dallas more than anything. Explain what that means. I know what I know what it means, but explain that to some of our listeners. Well, because Eric didn't want to push Dallas because thought because they were friends that Eric was pushing his friend and Eric made it more difficult for Dallas to get over because of their relationship, thinking that he wouldn't, Yeah, you know, they, it's like, okay, I, Dallas going out, I'll put you out there. I'll do it. But thinking he's not going to be able to pull this off. Right. But Dallas did pull it off. And I dare say that, you know, yes, Dallas had ability. Dallas had everything else. But what Dallas has to this day is the attitude of I'm, I'm never going to give up until I succeed and do what I want to do. And that's what made the difference with Dallas page. And when he got the opportunity, made the most of the opportunities and, you know, more power to him. I was very happy for him as a human being because I know how much it meant to him. Yeah. And and who would have ever guessed that he would have been so successful out of the ring as well. You know, uh, the same work ethic that, that made him successful in wrestling has made him successful in business and man, DDP yoga or DDP. Why he gets mad if you call it yoga now, uh, it's legit. Everybody's using that thing worldwide and they continue to, to top themselves year after year. Right. And he's doing exactly what he did then now. And there was an excitement about him and some people laughed at it in the beginning. And at the end of the day, everybody's going, yeah, Dallas page, man. And he made it real and he made himself relevant. And Dallas was able to become a top guy in spite of everything that was thrown against him. Really one of the, um, one of the great underdog stories in wrestling. Cause nobody really saw it coming. what do you think of him uh, exiting through the crowd? That was, uh, not something anybody was really doing in wrestling at the time, but it, so it was unique to him. I thought it was a nice touch sort of showed that he was the man of the people. Well, that's what he was looking for. It was just, I'm just one of you. So I'm going to go on out and hang out with you. Yeah. You get mad at me whenever I say, oh, I'm just a fan. You, you think I'm pulling a gimmick too, but I am. Yeah. Okay. Conrad. So uh, my man Mongo. Yeah. Matt Coon's favorite wrestler. 
doing a sit down here talking about, uh, how Arn Anderson needs to open the gates and unleash the horseman. Uh, and he's ready to go. And, uh, this means as much to him as being on soldier field and being one of the monsters of the midway and blah, blah, blah. What'd you think of Mongo as a horseman? You actually worked with him before anybody else. I think in wrestling, cause you guys brought him in during the whole LT stuff a few years prior, right? Yeah. I hated Mongo as a horseman. I thought it was silly and stupid and made no sense. I didn't get it. Um, we had, we had Steve for WrestleMania 11 as part of LT's kind of entourage and being the guy out there. And Steve was the one that we picked to work with, uh, uh, comma the Godfather. And when those two bears collided, it was a thud. And I remember Vince and I watching it going, holy shit, that was a money thud because it felt it, what it felt real because it was real and said, that guy gets it. Meaning Steve McMichael, uh, we tried to say, Steve, when you're, we're, you're done and you want to do something, come back and talk to us. WCW got him first, offered him a lot more money and, uh, they got the most, they got more out of, uh, Mongo than I think anybody could have. I, I don't know that we could have gotten that much out of Steve McMichael. I don't know that we would have had that much time and patience with him. Let's talk about patience for WCW because they've got to have a lot because here in 98, they're getting hit with lawsuits left and right. We've talked about the lawsuit that you guys threw at them from Sean Waltman, but, um, Bobby Walker, hard work, Bobby Walker, is going to file a $5 million racial discrimination lawsuit. And around this same time, Ric Flair is tied up with WCW two and Eric Bischoff speech in front of the crew. Uh, where he's saying he's going to sue Flair in a bankruptcy, blah, blah, blah. Boy, that's coming back to bite him. We've talked about how Vince handled. Look at this shit. Scott Putsky. Oh boy. Boy, you guys tried your, your stuff with him too. We'll get back to Scott in a minute. When you see WCW taking all of these lawsuits on, I mean, Vince was there just what? Four years prior at this point. Does it not feel like, uh, if you're super successful at anything, the lawsuits are just going to come for you. It's just part of it. But then when you see something like the Ric Flair thing, do you think maybe Eric brought that on himself? Uh, and what was your, what was your take on the Bischoff Flair lawsuit or what was the WWF's take at the time? Well, unfortunately, Believe it or not, you, you really don't wish that kind of stuff on anybody because if if they're doing it with one, they're going to do it with the other. Right. And they're just looking for any any kind of payday that anybody can have. Um, so y- you hate to see it on either side. If it's something like the Bischoff and Flair lawsuit, that's something that could have been avoided. And that's probably something that was unnecessary, but it's just a shame. And it, and it kind of sucks because like I said, when the news media reports it nine times out of 10, they were talking about WWE because we were still the brand. You know, we, we were the brand we're the standard bearer. And when, whenever they talk about any kind of re- anything to do with wrestling, they're going to label it us. Cause they just don't know. They don't take the time to really define what the difference is most of the time. So yeah, it, it was, it sucked for them and it was watched. Those kind of lawsuits were monitored from the standpoint of what's happening. How is the legal process reacting to this stuff? One of the things, um, that I thought of when you were saying, you know, that they didn't know that they just thought wrestling was WWF. And I think people do that a lot now with MMA. They say, oh, he's doing that ultimate fighting. Oh, he's doing UFC. And really he may work for Bellator or somebody else, but they do this in other areas too. You know, I think a lot of people say band-aid or Kleenex. Those are brands, not products. It's a bandage or a tissue, not a band-aid or a Kleenex. And you know, there's certain silly conspiracy theories out there about AEW and when the pay-per-view orders came in, a lot of the bills said WWE. And so this is fuel to the fire to those silly 
conspiracy theories where they say, oh, WWE really owns AEW and this is proof. And I'm like, no, guys, whoever keyed that in for the cable system just says, oh, it's wrestling. It must be WWE. That's how that happens, right? Exactly. Uh, that's just uh, absolute silliness. So but states clearly for the record, WWE doesn't own AEW. That's, I mean, I can't believe I'm even asking you to do that, but oh it's my like, God, <laughs> I can't, I won't even dignify that with an answer. It's I'm a, still mesmerized about the, the two pirates. Is this a pirate match? It is the loser. Scott gets- Putsky came out dressed like a pirate. The other one's got the eye patch pirate eye patch. Are they battling for a boat? Uh, it's a, uh, they're battling for booty. Uh, Missy Hyatt, Scott, Scotty Riggs. Well, Scotty Riggs ever got on you guys, uh, radar. He he had a run here. He's part of the American males with buff Bagwell. Then he joins the flock. He's doing this gimmick and eventually he's going to wind up leaving here. Pops up in ECW. I think he was pals with Rob Van Dam does a, a bit of a feud there, but he may have done some stuff in TNA here or there. I kind of forget, but he never really did anything with you guys. Why wasn't Scotty Riggs on the radar? I, I just think that he was just another guy. I, and I don't mean that in a disparaging way. It's there wasn't anything that really stood out. And I'll, I'll say the same thing about Scott Putsky, uh, who he's in the ring with right now. There wasn't anything over the top unique about either one. Except one's got, you know, Scotty has the band aid on his, on his eye and. Good Lord. Are they really go fighting over booty? No, I was just, listen, this is, we're, we're filling time. This is a, a three hour nitro. Uh, they've just gone to three hours. They're trying to fill the time. And this is a WCW Saturday night match. That's now on uh nitro. By the way, when did, when did you first realize that the, uh, WCW had hired Billy Bob Thornton's character sling blade to be a referee? <laughs> <laughs> Tell me Scott uh, Dickinson doesn't fucking favor a sling blade. He does. Oh my God. You're fucking brutal. Come on. That's funny. Mustard and biscuits. I like my... mustard. I like taters. There you go. I like taters and mustard. So you know who sling blade is, is based on, right? <laughs> John, John Paul Shellnut. John Paul Shellnut. Scott Puss, John... you got the win. Are you surprised? Oh, well, well, hell no, man. He used the Polish hammer. Of course he's going to win. What was, what was a miss? Why didn't Vince fall in love with Scott Putsky? I mean, he's uh, a heritage guy, multi-generation guy. He's got a good physique. We tried an awful lot with Scott Putsky's, you know, Scott, unfortunately the same thing, connecting with the audience, being able to cut a promo and make you believe other than Polish power. What else was there? And he had, he looked great. Looked like a million bucks, but just, there was, there was no connection. And Scott was playing a part instead of being the part. Same thing. There's Worst your- cover ever. Jesus Christ. That was the shits. I like this, uh, critical Bruce. This is what I thought you'd be saying the whole time. Well, I, uh, you know, I'm not going to create some of the shit was decent, but that was a drizzling fucking shits. Uh, this show, as we get a wide shot of the crowd here, uh, they're going to announce 39,919 fans on the broadcast, but when it's all said and done, the actual number in the building, according what did to that Meltzer, fucking door do to Goldberg boy, a lot we can talk hey. about there. What the fuck? So we're, we're, this is all about Goldberg. This is his first win back in September of 97 on Nitro. He would debut against Hugh Morris and, uh, gets the big win. And it's kind of funny because Shivani has told us that on this episode, they didn't tell him what to call him. So as he's making his way to the ring, they still don't know. Are they calling him Bill Goldberg? Are they calling him Goldberg? What's the name we're using? And then he, you know, presses the little cough button and says to the back or to the truck, Hey, uh, I don't have a name for this fucking guy. What are we calling him? And that's when Bischoff said, just call him Bill Goldberg. But there was no real 
rhyme or reason or thought put into it. It's just, Hey, here he is. And then he caught fire and they kept the streak going and it worked. And here is a returning Scott Hall, Scott Hall, who's had his issues. And that's the reason he's been off TV, of course, gets out and I can't help, but have a little nod to that. Cause he brings a, a glass, uh, like a little low ball with him or high ball with him and sits it on the top. And here he is. This is who Goldberg is going to have to get through the returning Scott Hall. And if he beats Goldberg. Goldberg loses his shot at the world title in the main event tonight. Wow. And I really like how the cameraman can't clean his lens either. Well, there's only one camera there. If he cleans it, what are they going to show? There's ways to do it. Conrad professionals know how to do it. Well, tell us how, uh, no, that's, that's like the, the buried live. I can't do that, man. That's inside fucking goddamn information that not everyone needs to know. Bubba Dean could do it though. I'll tell you that right now. Outcomes strutting that ass. And this sucks about the WWE network because we don't get Jericho's music at the time, which wasn't great music, but instead we get break the walls down his WWE theme. And, uh, here he is heel, arrogant, cocky, Chris Jericho doing his thing. He's the cruiserweight champion. And as a reminder, he's in the middle of that feud with Dean Malenko, uh, Malenko. Uh, left and then showed back up in a uh, battle Royal. He was dressed as a luchador. The winner of the battle Royal would get a shot at Chris Jericho. The mask comes off once the luchador won and ta-da, it's really Dean Malenko. Dean wins great stuff. Uh, a few months prior to this, he would have put Ray Mysterio out of commission and he's on a collision course with Dean Malenko for that cruiserweight title six days from now at bash at the beach. So. Chris is going to start getting a little bit of heat here and, uh, firing up the crowd about what's coming next, but you see that huge crowd I mentioned, they say on the show, 39,919 fans. Meltzer says it was actually more than that. Oh my fucking God. 41,412 fans. Of course. Of course. Yeah. If it was us and we had 41,000, you say, well, they really only had 1900 there. He says the paid is 35,514 fans, which destroyed the previous company record from January 6th when they were in the same building and they had 23,000 paid and it devastated the gate record set for Starcade 97, which was the biggest gate ever in WCW history, 541,000. When you hear they're doing these big numbers, is it motivating because you know that the business is healthy? Are you pissed that it's happening for them? It sort of feels like mixed emotions. I mean, I think you described that to me once as your mother-in-law driving your new Cadillac off a cliff. Yeah, no, it it is. It's encouraging because if, if they're doing good business and we're doing good business, yes, it's a lot of good business to go around now. Okay. So this is JJ and Lenny lane in there. So Lenny's oh. the champion. Listen to you trying to disparage the Ayatollah of rock and roll. Does he not look like Lenny Lane? He fucking looks just like Lenny Lane with that hairstyle. So, uh, he's calling out Dean Malenko saying that these guys can't touch. He's finally Dean Malenko's finally got his world title shot or his uh, cruiserweight title shot, but he can't touch him. Uh, because if he does, he'll lose that opportunity. They've got to get a handle on this and Dean and Jericho have made it too personal. So no touching and you get your title shot in six days. So you know what Jericho is about to do. He's going to start a little soft and say, what if I said your mom wore army boots? What if I said you were just a jobber? What if I said that your dad was on the road every night in a different hotel, craving human companionship and your mom knew it. So now you and your brother don't even look alike. And here comes the attack. See, I just stuck my finger in his face and go, I'm not touching you. I'm not touching you. I'm not touching you. Where does Dean Malenko rank? Um, you know, as far as, uh, I don't know how much of that you saw, but as an agent, as a backstage, you know, uh, not, not on screen, not in ring. Everybody knows what he did there, but how valuable was he to the WWE when he was a producer or agent or whatever the role you guys had him in? You know, for the for the time that I was there and and witnessed Dean, Dean, Dean was a solid agent as far as helping guys technically in the ring. And 
that's where Dean excels. Dean's a good coach, and Dean is able to really teach people, you know, how and what to do and when. So I think that uh, as far as his training and going back, that's where Dean Malenko excels. Jericho coming into his own as a heel character here. Um, my favorite Jericho was 98. Is there a, a part of his career that really sticks out to you where you think, man, that's when he was at his best. God, I, the, the part about Chris Jericho that I've continually enjoyed is, is reinventing himself and being able to, you know, come back when Chris first came in to WWE and was able to hang and get out there and be, you know, the first undisputed champion. And he took that and made it even more than that can be a pinnacle. And, and that was something that Jericho made larger than life, even larger than it was. So this is a lot of good moments. That's a tough one to call because he's had a lot of great ones. I do want to mention what we're doing right now, a watch along for nitro from July 6, 1998. We're actually doing this coming Monday with Eric Bischoff where he'll watch raw from July 6th, 1998. Now raw was not live. I think I mentioned that it was taped June 30th in state college PA. And, uh, you guys are, you sort of see what WCW is offering up here. And after this, uh, pull apart, Chris Jericho is going to have a, a title match defending his cruiserweight belt against Ultimo dragon. But here's what was happening on raw that night. Savio Vega defeats Brockus in the uh, brawl for all match. Ken Shamrock. Main event anywhere in uh, West Berlin, Nova Scotia. Thank you. Uh, Ken Shamrock is going to beat Jeff Jarrett with Tennessee Lee by DQ. Bradshaw and Vader are going to go to a no contest. The DOA, which was eight ball and skull, they're going to have uh, Paul Ellering in tow and they're going to get a win over the headbangers. D'Lo Brown. Is going to have the Godfather in his corner when he defeats Terry Funk. Uh, Darren Drozdoff and Road Warrior Hawk are going to have another brawl for all match. That's going to end in a draw. Val Venus is going to defeat Dustin Runnels, who at this point is doing a, a born again gimmick, not the normal gold dust situation. Ken Shamrock is going to defeat Mabel. And then the main thing on the show, besides, well, we'll, we'll get back to that. The Undertaker and Mankind on top, number one contendership match. That's your main event of the show. But the thing everybody remembers from that show is the parody from the Nation of Domination or from DX on the Nation of Domination. So that's this show. And we kick their ass. No, you know better. But I mean, realistically, when when you know that Oh fuck. They're calling an audible. Cause that rating came down, uh, the day after the, so there's King of the ring, tons of intrigue, mankind off the top. Austin loses the belt. Everybody wants to see Monday night raw. You guys beat them by more than a point. The main event is Austin winning the belt back. I mean, can't beat that Tuesday. WCW takes their lump Wednesday. They have their conversation, figure it out Thursday. They put it together, make it happen. And they announce on thunder, the B show, the biggest B show in the history of B shows that this is the main event. And you just said at the top of the show, what'd you think? And you said, hot shot at the time. I think most people were saying, oh, they're giving away a pay-per-view main event. This could have been Starcade. This could have been Halloween havoc. They're leaving millions of dollars on the table. Eric would say we were losing market share. And we had an opportunity to do something big. And at the end of the day, we were a television company. We're not supposed to save the best things for pay-per-view. We're supposed to put the best things on television. And that's a totally different approach from the WWE who is trying to create as much revenue as possible. Did you think they should have saved Goldberg and Hogan for a pay-per-view? I do. I, I, if the. If the idea is to make money, I think that that was a, a money match that they could have saved for pay-per-view to bring that revenue up somehow, some way. 
and build to it versus giving it away. I also understand the television company because the business at this point in time, it's changing. It's, it is all about the ratings and it is all about advertising revenue and things of that nature. The rights fees and all that, that wasn't as much of, of a big deal at this point. It's always going to be a big deal, but it was, it was different. And I think that for WCW, yeah, they were a television company. We were an overall entertainment company. We, we did live events, we did pay-per-views and we made money on all of those. And we had to make money on all of those. If nitro didn't draw and they gave away 50,000 tickets, they didn't care because that gate didn't mean as much to them. It, the gate still meant as much to us. I guess we should explain too, that, um, Dean Malenko is being arrested here because he's been told not to touch Chris Jericho. He's not allowed to touch Chris Jericho security escorted him out. And now he's going to do a run in during the match and they arrest him. This feels a little bit Steve Austin esque, doesn't it? Well, of course it does. So did Goldberg. Oh, I can't wait to talk about that with you. The nitro girls are here. Goldberg's less than 10 months into his wrestling career. I, I know we mentioned that, but. We're talking September 22nd, 1997 in Salt Lake. And now here he is in front of the largest crowd in the history of this company, the fourth largest crowd ever for pro wrestling in the United States. It's going to be one of the biggest pops of the night or, or of, of the year when he wins. And, um, Meltzer would start his newsletter saying it can be debated whether at this stage of the game, putting the title on Goldberg was premature and a panicked reaction to being drubbed in the ratings the previous week. What can't be debated is that the lesson learned from the flop that was sting was learned from. And once the decision was made to do it this time, it was done right. And of course he's talking about, you know, sting beating Hogan at Starcade, and there's supposed to be a fast count and it's not and that whole debacle. This big crowning moment of toppling Hogan was supposed to be sting and the way it went down and the booking that followed it, it just wasn't, but they're doing it right here with Goldberg. It's going to be a big crowning night. Look at this Johnny Swinger coming to the room. What is this? It's your boy. It's Johnny Swinger. What do you think of this outfit? Looks like he has half of Jeff Jarrett's old outfit. Who's the guy in the back? That's Wildcat Willie. He is the WCW mascot. He he is he is their gobbledygooker. Ah, okay, cool. But he wasn't you could born. have said gobbledygooker. I'd have got that. Mascot, come on, you know what that is. So chat me up. Do you think they did this one right compared to what they tried to do with Sting? Well, I think that as far as if you're going to do it the first time with Goldberg, yes. I to me that's the only finish that you go with. And that's the only way here after every, everything you've done to build this guy up and everything that you've done to get to that point. Yeah, that's absolutely logic one oh one, but all the time WCW at the time wasn't interested in logic. So kind of surprising that they actually did that. Meltzer would write Hogan, who from all accounts had no problems putting Goldberg over the right way as was originally planned. Those original plans formulated by him were for this to be non-title and non-televised. And that was supposed to be the dark match main event here at the Georgia dome. But those plans were officially changed on July 2nd as a response to the previous week's ratings drubbings. The current plans subject to change in the next panic attack are for Goldberg to keep the title for the time being and not do a quickie back to Hogan because of the feeling that Goldberg could be the man in the business and not screw it up as they did with sting. Hogan had no problem doing the job the right way for Goldberg, but in return, apparently got the promise of being when the time is right, the person to end Goldberg streak. Although present plans are for that to be a long time coming. Uh, he would also say it's generally believed that WCW was going to win the week, but at what cost? Because he, he says this is probably a $7 million pay-per-view bonanza that they forfeit just for a big rating here. What do you think of that? I would agree with that. Maybe even more because it was such a big match that 
the audience was clamoring for, and it was one of those, you know, pick them. You, you, you really couldn't call it. You wanted to call it. You wanted to, to know that your guy was going to win, but you just couldn't call it. So, yeah, I think that that would have been great on pay-per-view to get everybody involved in that. They could have done an angle. They could have done something more to get to that moment. We mentioned earlier that, you know, this broke the gate record, which was set at uh, Starcade for 541,000. How about here? It's 906 grand. So nearly a million dollar gate Goldberg would never lead them. Nobody would in WCW to a million dollar gate, but this is about as close as they ever got 906,000. Uh, the merchandise figure is going to top $300,000 here. So it's a $1.2 million day. And of course they're going to win the ratings as well. Let's talk about the match in the ring though. We saw Chavo come to the ring wearing a helmet. He's taking on Johnny Swinger. What do you think? And worked the first part of the match with one arm because he was hiding his messed up haircut with the other. I guess that's what he was doing. But and he, we just had that match with him and what Jacqueline uh, that we did recently talking about it on WWE. And Chavo worked a one arm match there and was better than just most guys with both arms. Uh, he's covering his, his head because he's in a hair match at the upcoming pay per view. And, uh, if he loses to Eddie, it's a Eddie Guerrero, Chavo Guerrero hair versus hair match. So he's trying to protect his hair here. Get that over, I guess. As well. He should. So let's talk Beautiful about head of hair. the main event again and how we got here. Cause this is really all about Goldberg. Hogan wrote in his book, our ratings were down. The bottom line was hurting. And of course it all fell on the shoulders of Eric Bischoff. One night I got a call from the guy. He said, I'm sitting here with six of my best friends trying to figure out how to get the nose back up on this thing. In other words, he's drinking a six pack all by himself, trying to find a way to boost WCW's numbers. If this was your company said, what would you do? I said, that's easy, brother. If it were my company, I'd put the belt on bill Goldberg. I was scheduled to wrestle him in a dark match, a match that would only be seen by the people in the arena, but not on TV. And I told Eric Bischoff to switch gears, televise the match and let Goldberg win. I said, nothing would have more impact than having Goldberg beat Hogan for the belt. He seems to be a great guy. Why don't we give him a chance? Eric made the call and it was all the rain. So the match went off and Goldberg, uh, Goldberg beat me easy for me to say good sport that I was. I put the belt on him myself. People in the state of Georgia were happy that I got my ass beat by their homeboy. So. Of course, Hogan says this is his idea. Uh, Bischoff backs that up, but he says that Hogan called him and pitched it. Um, of course, Meltzer wrote, and I read it, that, hey, the promise was made. He'd get the wind back down the road. Bischoff laughs at that and says no fucking conversation like that ever took place. Where would you land on that? Do you think that, is that Meltzer wanting to assume that everybody's politicking or Hogan, especially, or do you think that conversation could have happened about creative of, Hey, I need to get the win back. Okay. I'm, I'm going to say something here and I will not go into detail, but, uh, very recently I, I read something on one of these sites that was all attributed and it was all from Dave Meltzer who detailed the story about something. And it was a long, drawn-out thing. And it was 100%, with the exception of names that were correctly spelled, 100% fiction. Just total, complete fiction. So do I believe that uh, that conversation happened? Uh, if Eric says it didn't, then I doubt it did. All right. You can't because I, because I can't, uh, I just, there's so, there's so many things that, that Meltzer reports and he would report then of this happened, this happened. And they're just out and out fictional lies that he just makes up because no one else will debate and no one else will call him on his bullshit because it's confidential information. 
But because he's saying it and his audience looks at him as this guru that knows everything and he just doesn't. He is a fictional writer. He is a Stephen King. He writes fiction. And so I think that he just put shit together and people will say, oh, I, you know what? I, I could see that happening. Yeah, that, that must be what happened. And then it becomes fact because enough people say it over and over again. And, and that's so w to answer your question, do I think that the conversation happened? Maybe it did. Maybe it didn't. Who knows? But uh, I doubt very seriously that Dave Meltzer knew. You can't leave us hanging like that. I know we're not going to talk about current stuff, but what did you read? That was total fiction. Give us a hint. I, 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 Dave Meltzer comments, <laughs> <laughs> but it's something that's, that's current that's going on now. Yeah, it was current. Yeah, okay. it was, it was current and, and it was, you know, things like uh, just, it, it's silly shit. It's silly shit that he reports as fact that this is what it is. This is what's going to happen. This is what did happen when it's just out and out untrue in every single, let, in every turn. Well, if and, and that's what frustrates me. I totally get, and I'm, I'm a hundred percent on board with, we can't talk about anything current. I mean, that's not the spirit of the show. So I'm just going to say, let's move on. Yeah. And fuck Dave Meltzer. Okay. We got that. We know how you feel on that. That's, that's pretty well established. By the way, this is the biggest. Hey, week. ho, <laughs> hey, ho. There's your public enemy. Did you have a favorite? Like just personally hanging, drinking beers, bullshitting. Uh, as far as between the two public enemy guys. Yeah. Oh, I love uh, Ted Petty. I. Why is he so universally loved? I knew the answer before I asked. We've never talked about it, but that dude just, I mean, everybody loves him. I mean, there's even for years, there was a Ted Petty invitational. Yeah. Ted, Ted just was a really great guy. Loved the business and, um, a very personable and very likable guy. Johnny is, uh, I would compare Johnny to uh, Brian knobs. Um, kind of out there, Johnny uh, and, and Johnny grunge was a nice guy too. I just really. I had known Ted Petty for many years before that. What was he? The He wasn't the zebra kid, but under the mask. And Ted Petty just was always, to me, a very class guy, and I enjoyed his outlook on the business and always got along with him. And just he happened into a, a fun gimmick in ECW that was great for ECW. Unfortunately, didn't. Didn't get over or translate anywhere beyond that. Cheetah kid is what you were thinking of. Cheetah kid. Yes. Yeah. He started wrestling in 78, which I think probably surprises a lot of people. It does me. Yeah. But he was just one of those guys that was always around in the Northeast and a likable, just a likable guy. He's in there with disco inferno, uh, Alex, Wright And Tokyo Magnum is hanging out here somewhere. Uh, Alex, Wright, Why did he never get a look with you guys? He did. Uh, we, we talked about using Alex, Wright before, but I think every time that we would get close to Alex, Wright, WCW would re up him or he would just want to go back there. I think Alex had a comfort zone in WCW that that's where he wanted to be. And that was the place he was used to. What about, uh, disco inferno? Why did he never Di get a shot? I don't know that disco ever really reached out to get a shot, but, uh, I've always found disco highly entertaining and Disco's one of those guys that had, he been with the WWF with that gimmick, I think would have gotten over tremendously. Yeah. Uh, Tony and I have talked about, you know, if disco had been given a different gimmick, you know, obviously he pulled off the disco inferno gimmick tremendously, but if Glenn Gilberti had a different gimmick, what could that have looked like? And Eric Bischoff thinks that disco may have missed his calling. He would have been a tremendous manager. Obviously that's not really the thing here in wrestling, but if he could have been transported back to the eighties, he would have been a hell of a manager. 
I would I would actually second that, but I also think that as a character heel and then later on becoming a character babyface, a la the honky tonk man, Disco Inferno would have been one of those iconic characters in WWE had he been there in the boom time. Yeah, what could have been? So uh, I guess we should talk a little bit about the week WCW is going to have here. The biggest week in company history. Uh, They're going to have the second best pay-per-view in company history. And over that eight day period from, um, if you count July 6th, where we are now, and you go all the way to the 13th, they're going to run six shows totaling more than a $2 million gate. So $335,000 average, another 782 grand in merch six and a half on pay-per-view. So it's over 9 million bucks for the week here, which is just incredible. Uh, we should mention too, they run the forum on the 10th. So four days after this, before they get to the bash of the beach, they have the largest wrestling crowd at the forum ever 14,678 paying fans. Uh, but with paper 15,821, just huge, huge business for WCW. WWE obviously doing their thing. Very, very profitable, more profitable than ever before at this point. But, uh, this week was a WCW win Tokyo Magnum. What's your favorite Tokyo Magnum match? Who the hell's Tokyo Magnum? He's the Asian fellow laying on the table. Why is he laying up there? Is he tired? They put him up there. Got who they Conrad pronouns, pal. We, are you watching the monitor? I know you're playing. I, I, I am. I'm just for our fans at home. This is radio. We have to tell them that the guys in the yellow <laughs> shirts, put the little fella up on top of the table and then did a cartwheel over on top of him. It's not radio. We told them we're doing a watch along. Yeah. But for some of them, it's radio. Uh, oh, here comes the dreaded trash can lid. Oh my God. You know, I don't, I know that, uh, You were telling me the other day that you and Stephanie decided you didn't need an alarm system at your house anymore. And you didn't, you got rid of all your attack dogs. You guys now just had cookie sheets and aluminum trash cans by every door just for, you know, defense purposes, self-defense. Yes. And cookie sheets. Yeah. Cookie sheets are really the the most dangerous item. I mean, if they know that that cookie sheet is like the shotgun of 2019. Brother, the cookie sheet comes out. They're, they're like begging off. People Please, scatter. no cookie sheet. And then they look in the background and they see a stop sign back there. They know shit's going to be on. And they might even see, you know, depending on, on how rough the neighborhood is, they might even see a literal kitchen sink laying in the corner. It could happen. It has happened. The referee for that match was Brian Hildebrand, uh, arguably uh. one of the best referees ever. But he never really got a shot with you guys. Uh, he was one of Corny's boys. Why didn't he? Well, he had his deal there. He he worked down in the South and just it never really happened. But I'd known Brian for 35 years. Well, if he were still with us, but I'd known Brian uh, since the 80s and just one of those, another universally loved, loved human guy. Yeah. Just, just a wonderful person, man. I I love Brian Hildebrand. So we continue our show here. And of course it's all about Goldberg, but we're going to do a little bit of a detour as we introduce buff Bagwell back in late April on thunder. He's wrestling against, uh, the Steiner brothers. Rick Steiner comes off the top with the top rope bulldog, but he lets loose of his head. And so Bagwell's head actually comes down, hits Rick Steiner in the back. And for a few minutes, he has a very scary moment where he can't feel his limbs at all. So this is the first time they sort of card him out here to acknowledge the people and, um, just wave. And it's a, a feel good moment. And he's really, really pushing hard that, you know, his mom, Judy has been a savior for him. And, you know, he could, he could take the whole three hour nitro and that wouldn't be enough time to tell you all the great things about Judy Bagwell. This is eventually going to be an angle, of course, not tonight, but, uh, this is the first time we see him in the wheelchair in the neck brace. And, uh, he is as white meat baby face as they get. And they're doing this because the last time we saw him, he was a bad guy and he was with the NWO and he's with, you know, things are a mess. And now he's, he's a good guy. What do you think of this? decision to turn 
a real life thing and do an angle. It's good stuff, huh? Well, as long as we know that the real life thing that he's out of the woods yeah, yeah, and we know that he's okay. And then, Hey, it's, it, it does become fair game, but it's a scary moment when you're laying there on the mat, not knowing whether or not you're going to feel anything below the neck. And that's what buff went through. And to be able to come back from that is a success story in and of itself. And I think the audience from that viewpoint looks at it and it's just happy to see him, to see him up and see him talking. So it's a win-win, you know, if he's going to come back and we know that it's going to be safe for him to come back, then sure. Wheel him on out there and let everybody see him. I feel like we should mention that, uh, Bagwell here is doing the best interview of his career. So if you are a buff Bagwell fan, both of you, uh, go back and listen to this one. This is a good one. And, um, it's a huge ovation. The crowd's really behind him. It is a feel good moment. He's not going to talk about coming back to wrestling. He's saying that he's just thankful to be here and have one more chance to tell these fans how much their support has meant to him. It was a very real moment, you know, when the injury happened. So it's kind of a, a cool moment that we get to see him come back here in the background. We see the entrance set for WCW and you and I last year saw those WCW letters for the first time in a long time. Absolutely. In the, in the warehouse by golly. And, uh, all that stuff is, is sitting up there right now. I'm waiting for somebody just to come and dump him out of his wheelchair. Back in the day, Buck Robley were booking this bruiser. Brody would come and just dump him out of the wheelchair and put the boots to him right now, whether they knew he was in a good place or not. The same uh, week that this is going down, you guys on your side of the woods kick off promotion for your biggest non pay-per-view endeavor in years. It's a house show on August 8th called foot brawl at the Foxborough stadium, the home of the new England Patriots. Uh, of course that never happened, but during this big kickoff party on July 1st, there's an arm wrestling match with Vince McMahon and Steve Austin. I know you've told the story before, uh, but it's worth telling again here. Oh, it was absolutely great because we were out on an Island there in Boston for the big arm wrestling bout and I, you know vince and, and steve had their little tete-a-tete back and forth and so they do the arm wrestling with michael hayes as the host michael or, or doc Hendricks. he was still doc Hendricks at the time as the host officiating everything and austin beats vince in the arm wrestling and then vince makes an audible and tells steve to throw him into the water yeah, throw throw me into the damn the, the, the water here. Not knowing how deep it is, not knowing what that water is. I think it was a, a drainage for a sewage plant, but uh Vince went in. And when Vince went in, he's scrambling, trying to get the hell out, yelling for me to help him. Help me, Bruce, help me. And my job that day was to stay with Steve Austin and just make sure that Austin was all set which one I turned to Michael Hayes and I said, Michael, God damn it. Help Vince. He can't swim. And Michael goes to help Vince and Vince pulls Michael Hayes in fully clothed into the shit water. And, uh, it's a fun time had by all. Let's just say that, but met with the, the, the craft family that day. And that was pretty interesting. And, uh, I didn't get to go into the meeting or anything. We got to meet them and say hello. And, it was a, a fun, fun day. Get any massages while you're up there? No, I didn't. I hear they got Should some have. good ones. Yeah. Yeah. Should ask for a reco. I know. So here you go. We're getting into uh, our final hour of the show. You see the big, uh, firework treatment. Um, sort of, I guess you guys would call this a reset. Is that right? Yeah. If this is the top of their hour or something like that. Yeah. We're probably closer. Let's come on back and, uh, start a new hour, start a new show. One of the things they did different with nitro is they would change up the announce booth. And you're going to see here where earlier we had Larry Zabisco on the right. Now it's Bobby, the brain Heenan. If nothing else, they had a fucking a team announce crew here with Bobby and mean Gene and Shivani and Zabisco and today. Did they not? Yeah. And today still pissed off. He's still angry about something 
and I don't know what the hell he's staring at. But uh, without it, Bobby Heenan, anytime you put Bobby Heenan on an announced team, yeah, that's going to be your A team, folks. Uh, and after th- three three hours, it's good to kind of just change up who's who's telling us stories here. Conspicuous by his absence here, Bret Hart not here. He's agreed to uh, serve as a celebrity race starter for some auto race in Toronto this same night. So he's not on the biggest show, which is just, I don't know. It's the most WCW thing that we're going to talk about today. Probably Canadian hero. He's got to be in Toronto. Fucking a though, man, you're running the Georgia dome, biggest WCW gate in history. You would think you would want your highest, one of your highest paid guys there, right? Yeah, but it's Georgia. Oh, God damn. Oh, you're going to defend Georgia from Alabama. No, fuck Georgia. I'm just saying it's a dome. <laughs> it's a dome. Hey, you know what? There's a big sale going on over at uh, Bruce If you're looking to get some t-shirts from pro wrestling tees, they can get a hell of a deal this weekend, right? Absolutely. Save 20% by God and, uh, head on over there and get you some pronouns, pal. I used to be over still damn the hottest selling shirt over there and uh just go over and check it out man save yourself some money 20 percent of pro wrestling tees bruceprichard.com place to go and check it out so finally some more wrestling action after the uh, announcer reset and um as we get into the third hour you know it's been a while since we've done a watch along but three hours of a show whether it's nitro or it's raw it's a commitment time-wise, is it not? Yes, it is. Hey, yo, what's the bad guy? I guess we should mention too, the NWO has split. You've got the black and white and you've got the wolf pack. We'll see the wolf pack here in a little bit. The wolf pack is a relatively new thing at this point, only around, I think a couple months, maybe less. Uh, but Scott Hall has been sidelined and he's back here with the black and white. And we know the stipulation. Is going to be taking on Goldberg here, and he's the gatekeeper. If Scott Hall gets the win, no main event for Goldberg, no world title shot for Goldberg. But if Goldberg runs through and finishes Scott Hall, he's on his way to the main event for the world title. And they're not doing this at the start of the show. They're doing it at the top of the second hour. Traditionally in wrestling, you would do one at the beginning of the show or very early and then one at the end. Tell everybody why they do it at the crossover of the the final hour here. Well, the idea is, is when you're getting to whether it's the top of the hour or the middle of the hour, a lot of people are changing channels, seeing what else is on. Maybe they finished up one show and they're going to flip the channel and see what's going on elsewhere. And you come up at the top of the hour and there's something pretty cool going on in the ring. You see all these people there. You see superstars that, you know, and maybe you're going to stay a while. And if you hook them there, hopefully you've got them for the rest of the show. But that's the reason you always want to be in action. You always want to be doing something at the top of the hour and not be in commercial break like everybody else who has to segue to their next program. I guess we should mention that uh, by doing it at the top of the hour, here you see Goldberg, he is a United States champion. So if he wins the world title tonight, He's a dual champion, by the way, besides the undertaker, and and I'm not talking about crowd reaction. I'm just saying the actual presentation besides the undertaker, is this the coolest entrance in 98? No. What's cooler? Austin. Uh, Listen, I said, besides the crowd reaction, I mean, he's just walking out. Oh, I saw. I thought, uh, crowd reaction. I think it was, I think it was great. Yeah. I think that Goldberg had a cool presentation, man. Yeah, that's all I meant. Just the visual presentation, not the pop. Everybody knows Hogan, or not Hogan, but uh, Austin in 98 was just another decibel. I mean, another level in every way. But the actual visual presentation, uh, the Goldberg presentation was was pretty cool. I, I do want you to, uh, you know, you used to do this. You want to do some color commentary for this match, some play by play? It's not going to be long, I hope. Well, it's a Goldberg match, but. I don't know. Uh, did you remember ever seeing this match before now? No. Can't wait to get your take. It's a tale With, of two uh, Goldbergs in this show. It's what? It's a tale of two Goldbergs in this show. He has two matches. 
And I think everybody has an expectation. I did. I had an expectation that, well, fuck Scott Hall's going to get a better match out of him. You would think so. Well, we'll let you decide. So they lock up here, test of strength. Goldberg throws him off. Look at the crowd reaction from almost doing nothing. The crowd is bananas. They are so ready for anything. Goldberg. Goldberg, you know, see, and, and again, it's, it's, you, you give credit where credit is due. And by keeping Bill special and not letting Bill do a lot of things that made him special. And whenever he did anything, it was huge. And you're looking at at Goldberg now with Scott, which I'm looking at, Oh, wow. What was that? That was ugly. I think they fell down. Yeah, I, I think Scott fell down, and since Scott was holding on to Goldberg, Goldberg fell down too. Hey, I know you don't want to talk about anything new, but uh, you've worked with Goldberg back in 04, and you worked with him again this year. Night and day, I had the uh, most pleasurable time working with Goldberg this year, uh, actually. Yeah, I, I assumed you would say that because you know, I know that you didn't enjoy your time in 04, but everybody who works with him now says that he's the l- – watch this. Oh my God. What the fuck? (laughs) Everybody says he's a super great guy, but this match is, yeah. I mean, it's Scott Hall. What the fuck, man? And I I can't blame Scott in this, right? I've never seen Scott do any of this, you know, and 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 it's not even pissed now because he doesn't know what the fuck to do. Yeah. What do you do? It's like, let me be a heel asshole. God damn. Sell something I'm doing. How about a boot? How about I go pick? Oh, well, no, you're not going to go do that. How about we just go the fuck home? Cause that's what I would be saying right about now. And in fairness, this is, uh, and I've went on many Goldberg rants. This is not Goldberg's fault. Like WCW didn't properly train him to be in this spot. And he's being asked to do things here that he's not ready for. He's doing everything he's asked. I mean, I'm, I don't, I don't think he's like, I'm not going to school. I'm not, I don't, nobody ever had a, a story about Goldberg being uncooperative with trying to train or prepare. He just was thrown out there and had a look and got over. And I said, well, fuck, let's just keep feeding the beast. And now as a result, he's probably in over his head. Right. But I do think that from management standpoint, there should have been all this time in between that they should have honed those skills even more. But yeah, again, my point is the onus to do that is on Eric Bischoff. It's not on Bill Goldberg. Well, it's on both of them. Okay. And if it, if it's Bill Goldberg, he should have been in, he should have been to the arena, been the first one in the arena in the ring and asking guys, "Hey, teach me." But if he's a guy who doesn't come from a wrestling background, he probably needs some old vet to come say, "Hey, man, uh, they're right, need to be champ, but they can write something different. You need to work on this." Get in here early tomorrow and let's do blah, blah, blah. Right. Wouldn't it? No. Cause as a world-class athlete, you always want to be better. And Bill was a world-class athlete in football and he you know, still is a world-class athlete. He could have taken that time to go out and say, Hey, help me. What do you think of Goldberg school of selling where anytime you get punched, you just shake your head back and forth. <laughs> Yeah, well, I wish I could do that. <laughs> I've been punched in the teeth. It hurts. <laughs> yeah. Arm drag by Bill Goldberg. Oh my God. Two in a row. And I'm sure Scott's just like, fuck that went well. Do another one. Do another one. <laughs> do another okay. one. Okay. We can just do arm drags for the rest of the match. But again, now I will say this to, to, uh, for this match. This is the match that should have gone 30 seconds. Sure. And, and trying to get any, anything more out of it, but at least they're sending down the really competent guys right now to help like Virgil and, uh, Brutus. Or, yeah. But what is he booty daddy or what he, was, he was? He was the, uh, the booty disciple. Man. Yeah. He's the disciple. Okay. Okay. Booty disciple. I like that. Did you just, Yeah. I got to work on that. <laughs> I'm going to make that a thing. I'm going to get booty disciple over booty disciple by God. 
You're right. That does seem to be Bill's Bill Sully technique. Shake his head. <laughs> well, he's shaking it off. I mean, I know but, that's the gimmick. We're shaking it off, but it's like literally fucking everything Scott does. He just shakes his head. But it's very. I made this comparison the other day, and I, I, a lot of people didn't like it. But Goldberg is WCW's Ultimate Warrior. True that. All right, I'll so give here, you that one. Here we go. Here's what we're all here to see. Everybody Please knows it, but Scott Hall. Spear from hell dropped in like a ton of bricks. Look at the crowd, the intensity from Goldberg. I mean, second to none. The guy just has charisma dripping off of him. I get why he's in the spot he's in. It's just, he's probably not been trained to be there. Here we go. The jackhammer. That'll get her done. He's on his way to the main event, boys and girls. So what'd you think of his match with Scott Hall here? I thought that was fucking horrible. Yeah. Um, but again, you, you look at him, you look at the reaction of the audience and, and the, uh, Goldberg was over, dude, the crowd loved every bit of it. So, you know, the Eric Bischoff school of thumb a rule of thumb is, Hey, look at the fucking crowd. You know, we can sit here and star this and star that and be critical. Look at the crowd. Were they into it? Did they buy it? An upset. And did they pay money to come here and see him? Yes. 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 They paid to see him. They tuned in and droves to see him. So even though we can be critical, of, you know, the intricacies of the, the in-ring work, uh, it worked. It's funny. The Titanic sank when it hit Goldberg that signed in the arena. So many metaphors in that sign. There are. Oh, what a backdrop over rotate. (laughs) As Scott saying, yeah, I could have got my own bump out of that. Just. Let me go. But this is what they came to see. This is what the audience came to see. They came to see Bill Goldberg, Spear, and Jackhammer, whoever the hell he's in the ring with. Is that the palest you ever remember seeing, Scott Hall? I didn't really remember noticing that until right then. I was like, dude, he's normally like super tan. I know he, he had been doing some, you know, having some personal stuff go on. So tanning probably wasn't nearly. The priority maybe it once was, but it, it may have been in, in shock of being in the ring with bill. Sure. It's just pale. All the color yes. left him. Yeah. I get it. All the blood just kind of just rushed from his body. Oh my gosh. Tony Schiavone is loving this. The nitro girls dancing on the announcer set. How great is that? And one is touching him. Yeah. That's Sean's wife. My Whisper. God. That's her gimmick name here. Look at the little sly smile on Tony's show. Oh my God. Today is smiling. Well, yeah. How can you, I mean, who's upset about this? Well, this is true. This is true. This is like Mike today at one o'clock in the morning when we're like having a cigar and, and we're on about our eighth drink and we have the guy behind the bar making us different things with oysters. It's, you know, it's, that's the Mike today. I know what's today's go to drink. Ah, oh, man, we'll drink a lot. We drank a lot of Japanese beer. I don't remember what his go-to drink was as far as alcohol. I feel like but he's like dr- an IPA guy. I feel like no. Mike Tanae makes his own beer in his basement. <laughs> Why are you laughing at that? <laughs> uh, I, because I doubt, I highly doubt that Mike Tanae would make his own beer. I think Mike is, uh, well, you know, he's got like a porn Twitter, right? He's got a porn Twitter. <laughs> yeah. What does that even mean? I'll send you links later. Oh boy. So here's the gimmick. A guy posing to be Mike tonight years ago, uh, <laughs> went on a rant on social media and it may have been shut down now, but it was hilarious there for a little while that somebody of all the people just to sort of pretend to be, he pretended to be Mike tonight. So here you go. Hoovy juice. Is he, uh, one of the more, what could have been guys? I, I always thought psychosis and hooventude were, I mean, I don't, I don't think anybody would, would, could, would say anybody's on the Ray Mysterio level. Like he's the tippy type guy, but these guys were just right below. And for whatever reason, they never achieved like near the success Ray did. I know that Hoovy was a little wild and crazy, 
What about psychosis though? Why don't you think he, uh, did more with you guys? Well, I think that psychosis, first of all, the gimmick and the mask. And when you're talking about trying to take the mask off of psychosis, which I think they actually did here, it took, took all of his personality away because he had a cool mask with the hair and the different thing. Um, but look, I, and everybody shits all over this, but when you can't communicate with the audience verbally, it's you are behind the eight ball and you are at a disadvantage. So you're, you're taking away six. Oh shit. Hoovy almost went head first into the concrete there, but you're, you're taking away the character development that you need for the audience to be able to relate to you. Learn, learn enough English so that you can tell me something. And, and same thing, a guy going to, uh, Mexico, you better learn some Spanish. Uh, and I just think that is what was missing. Did they do great moves and did they do a bunch of crazy ass shit? Yes, they did. In fairness, why do I care? In fairness though, there were a lot of guys who drew big money and didn't speak at all. Who the Sheik, Andre, the giant, he had a manager Goldberg on, uh, well, Andre, see, Andre did do promos and the Sheik had a manager. So you're saying if psychosis and, and Hoovy had managers, maybe when they came over, you guys wouldn't have put them on lawnmowers. Only time you see, you still remember that that's when they were over. Oh my God. Please don't, please don't say that. You remember it, don't you? Yeah, but not because it was good, because I couldn't believe y'all did it. They loved it. All righty. No, I'm just telling you. Does anybody, seriously, when the Mexi Cools idea comes up, does anybody raise their hand and say, should we really do this? Why? It was great. Well, I mean, it's also a stereotype. Well, sometimes I think that, you know, the audience relates to stereotypes. I'm not saying that all stereotypes are good, nor that creative. However, it's, it's a lot of times, especially back in the day that that's what the audience understood. And, you know, the audience gotten a lot more sophisticated and obviously wouldn't do any of that shit, uh, today and sure as hell wouldn't want to take that finish from Hoovy juice with the 597 <laughs> degree, uh, spiral that he did. And here comes Kidman power bombing Hoovy off the top. And there goes the rest of the flock, Horace Hogan and sick boy and Riggs and Lodi. That's Michael Vick. That was Katie Vick's big brother. Wait, who was Michael Vick? Sick boy. I didn't know that. Yeah, that was going to be Katie Vick's brother. Or Scott Vick, Michael. It was Scott Vick. Yeah, that was going to be, that was Katie Vick's brother. That's how he was going to come in. That was the story. What happened? He sucked. (laughs) It wasn't the angle sucked. It was, he sucked. Yeah. That, That goddamn sick boy fucked up our Katie Vick genius. Yes. Well, what have been cool would have been if Scotty Vick and his doll mannequin, Katie Vick the cheerleader outfit could have tagged up against the Mexi cools and they would have rode down on one deers brother that shit. Okay. That's main event. Oh, WrestleMania God. all over it. Yeah. I like the www.wcwwrestling.com. Yeah. That's a lot of, that's a lot of shit there. Is it not? <laughs> yeah, I think they were a little bit behind the curve on just get the first three letters, man. Dot com. Yeah. Well, especially since it's WCW wrestling, like what's the last W stand for wrestling. Okay. Got it. <laughs> yeah. World championship wrestling, wrestling.com go to <laughs> world championship wrestling, wrestling.com. Yes. Or, or you could go to WWF federation federation. The World right. Wrestling Federation Federation. First Family Mortgage, mortgage.com. <laughs> 
1FMCMortgage.com. That's right, folks. First Family Mortgage, mortgage.com. So we're promoing Bash at the Beach. It's our big pay-per-view. It's six days from now. Of course, the main event is all about celebrity. They've got lots of mainstream intrigue and interest. Uh, you guys had just done this successfully with Mike Tyson, and now they're going to do it hugely successfully here with Dennis Rodman and Carl Malone. I mean, you guys both sort of got lucky in the uh, celebrity endorsement era here of 1998, right? Well, I, yeah, I would say that we really went after it and looked at ways to integrate them and put people where they would excel. Mike Tyson being in the ring as a referee and, and being out there as a part of the angle all the way through worked. I'm not sure that, that Carl Malone and Dennis Rodman wrestling that delivery. And I will say this, Carl Malone busted his ass and didn't embarrass himself out there in the ring. Um, Rodman, not so sure. You know, Dennis is Dennis is Dennis and he was going to do his stuff, but, um, yeah, you grow from the outside in. So they were definitely getting out as much as they could bringing in as many as they could to try and compete. You know, I, I know that you're uh, a fan of what DDP accomplished. What did Vince think of DDP in 98? I don't think that Vince was really, you know, Vince saw what people showed him at that time. Vince was so worried about his own stuff. Vince didn't, didn't look at it unless somebody would bring it to him and say, Hey, this really warrants you taking a look at, what do you think of this? And DDP had that reputation. He was a WCW guy. Why go after someone who is so entrenched and has made it known that they were a WCW guy? That wasn't, that wasn't something we were going to do. We were in a different place, especially at this time, because our business was taken off with new guys on top in our own organization. So let's focus on them and make them as much as we can. A couple days after 4th of July, you got to cart out Hacksaw Jim Duggan. Ho! Chat me up. Uh, Vince wasn't watching. Someone was. Who was tasked with, with keeping up with what was going on here? Finkel? Howard watched. I, I'm sure there are a lot of people that watched. I, I would always take a look at the tape, usually fast forward it. But if there was something interesting, I would say, okay, is there something we need to take a look at here? But to sit down and, and watch the entire show start to finish, didn't have time for that. Who is somebody giving a report like back then does Vince show up on, on Tuesday at the office and, and there's a report on his desk. Hey, here's what happened on Nitro that you need to know about or whatever. If there was something significant. Yeah. So there's who, something significant we knew. Yeah. Howard would watch the show and okay. He kind of give us a rundown and we had other people that would watch the shows and just try to give a rundown and let everybody know what was going on. If we needed to look at something. What about a night like this where you guys are taped and, and they're live. Are you watching then? Is Vince watching that? Probably not. He's probably watching our show to critique, critique it. it. Yeah. It's just fascinating to me that, uh, you know, Vince didn't watch. Uh, again, we were, we're focusing on our, on our stuff and it was let's, let's do what we can to make our shit better. I don't care what they're doing. If they do something really good, then let's look at it. Let's examine it and see if there's an opportunity so, for us. Fucking a, yeah. The hell is big show doing? Uh, he's about to choke slam the bejesus out of hacksaw. And then he's going to issue a challenge to Kevin green, uh, who he says has been running his mouth and he's tired of all these football players, blah, blah, blah. So Kevin green's going to come out. And, uh, of course, Kevin green has been on again, off again with the company for years, usually into something with Mongo or, uh, doing something with flair as sort of the, the hometown boys. Cause he's a hall of famer, but he's Carolina Panther at the time. So it makes sense. If you're going to do something with flair, you know, in Carolina, you do it with Kevin green and, um, these guys are going to have a match in six days. Uh, the giant here and Kevin green, what, what a cool, 
idea that is, but maybe not an execution for the giant just to throw his fist up and let Hacksaw fall into it. Well, if you watch uh, the infamous Ultimate Warrior and Andre the Giant match where Andre just brutalized Warrior, that was actually one of the spots where Warrior was going over Andre and Andre just stuck his fist up and punched him right in the groin. And then one time he came by and just punched him right, right in the face. And Warrior just didn't register, didn't know what to do. Just kept going. Sure as hell wasn't going to make a comeback. So you know what's coming here. It's the big uh, invite for Kevin Green. We must spend a lot of time, you and I, talking about Kevin Green. Well, how do you think he did? Kevin Green, you, you know, you look at a lot of the athletes that came from outside of the business and came in for whatever reason and had matches. Kevin Green, I thought, was another one of those guys that didn't embarrass himself. Right. Because he's an athlete. If you get a really great athlete like a Lawrence Taylor, a Floyd Mayweather, a Kevin Green, someone like that that is willing to put the time in to learn what to do, then... I thought Kevin Green did a good job for what he was put in there to do. And I remember, you know, I met him when they were training him uh, at some point in Atlanta. Uh, Super nice guy. But I don't know that the rest of the world really knew who the hell and or cared who he was. Right. And does he really look like a threat to a giant in, in, in the ring at that point? Well, first of all, it's hard to like a badass in white shorts. What's wrong with white? Just he had a red shirt and a white tie and look cool as shit. <laughs> That's what I needed. I was hoping you'd bite on that. Just, just saying, but I guess we should mention as we're, we're marching towards our main event here, the main event. Hulk and Goldberg is going to be the most viewed wrestling match in television history, at least from a cable standpoint up to that point. Uh, of course we've talked about Saturday night's main event with Hogan and Andre that just shattered all records back in the day, or I guess it was called the main event. Uh, either way though, the first quarter hour in the history of pro wrestling uh, on cable to reach 5 million homes is that match. So you've got 5 million, 54,000 homes, which Dave says uh, is an excess of 7 million total viewers. It's going to get a 6.91 rating and an 11.8 share. That's going to break the all time record of 4.7 million homes, which was a 6.53 and a 10.7 share. And this is just a few months old, that record. And it's Hogan and Savage uh, for the world title back on April 20th. Raw on this night, where we're covering here, uh, July 6th, gets a four. It's a four flat, 4.00. Nitro gets a 4.93. No surprise, I guess. It's up against the tape show, but considering they're pulling out all the stops here and they didn't beat you by a full point, and you're a tape show with Undertaker and Mankind for the 9,000th time, it's got to feel pretty good, huh? Well, we would have loved to have beat them, absolutely. But at the same time, when you look at it, as you just said, they had everything. This was a major pay-per-view television show. Right. With them putting everybody in there, and they've got Carl Malone, they've got everybody else under the sun on this show trying to do everything that they can. And uh, the big kid, the fucking Rhino Nightheart, uh, yeah, the, I don't know who the fuck Stu would have called in the WC. Brett, Brett, can you get the Rhino booked? So, I imagine with Brett being there that. I don't, I don't think that's a stretch. I think that's a fair assumption. That all of a sudden uh, Jim is there as well. But actually, looking at Night Art, God damn, he looks to be in great shape. Some of the best shape he's ever been in. Of course, we're, um, what, eight months removed from, uh, the Montreal situation. So he's here in WCW and 
Exactly right. He does look pretty good there. looks like the Jim Neidhart from the eighties. Yeah. And Jim Neidhart, you know, Neidhart gets a short end of the stick from the standpoint of who's, you know, the great worker and everything. Neidhart was one hell of a worker and Neidhart. I remember early on in mid South and coming through doing different things. He, he's a better tag team wrestler, but Neidhart was a damn good worker. But I think that the, you know, the tag team situations he was always put in, that he was always one half of something else. You don't right think now, he, you don't think he gets his just to, it's just, is that because he was teaming with, with, uh, Brett and Owen? I mean, two of the best of all time. It, we, you and I've sort of talked about before. But Chavo Guerrero had been a bigger star if Eddie Guerrero didn't exist type of deal. Right. And, and Neidhart, but even going back to the mid South, Neidhart with Barry Darso was a hell of a tag team. Yeah. Um, they'd both come from the, uh, both singles, but they were a great tag team and that's where he made his name and then getting in. Yes. If he hadn't have been teamed with Owen and Brett, Neidhart would have been probably a much bigger star. On his own. Carl Malone likes to grab DDP's ass. I noticed that a lot. That's like the third time I've seen that tonight. I think DDP really wanted to do that. Let's put our backs against each other and spin around and point to the crowd move. And I think that was Carl's only way of making sure, Hey, am I in the right, am I moving in the right direction and at the right speed? So he just put a hand there just to hold it, but you, oh, okay. you can make it into something that's not, if you'd like. Well, no, I just, I just noticed it again. So more highlights of, uh, the milestones that Goldberg hit, you know, they've shown us one and 25 and 50 and 75 and, you know, all the major milestones on the way here. I think he's like one of six here or something like that. Maybe one of seven now that he's beaten, uh, Scott Hall, the streak idea. When you first realize, Hey, they're doing a street gimmick with this guy. What do you think? It's a gimmick. And, and you obviously, the, the whole idea behind the streak is when do you beat the streak? Right. They're different than the Undertaker. So being able to do that, that, that being Goldberg's gimmick was, all right, how long are you going to take this? And, uh, man, they took it for a while made up some numbers, had some imaginary matches in Rio de Janeiro and built that some bitch up. Not a bad gimmick. I don't get this shit. What don't you get? The wolf pack? Yeah. Why are they, why are they different than the, the white pack? Well, because the white pack is led by Hulk Hogan and Kevin Nash wants to have a cool we're 10 years younger version. So, uh, he gets Luger and sting and Conan on his side. Uh, and the only members of the old guard on the other side are Scott Hall and Hulk Hogan, and then a bunch of B team guys. Hmm. I mean, here's the thing to me. I know that lots of people are critical of Nash for the wolf pack existing and him being the leader and blah, blah, blah. And I get that. However, Merch wise, it's pretty smart. I mean, back in the day, you guys would have John Cena never give up shirts and it's yellow. And then, you know, two months later it's orange. And then two months later it's blue. And then two months later it's green. I mean, this is another merch opportunity. It's the hottest selling shirt ever. So why not just pivot same shirt, slightly different color, rinse, slather, repeat. Can't argue with it. They needed a blue world order or yeah. <laughs> we well, have that with blue chew uh, and you can, uh, <laughs> try it right now and get your dick real, real hard with the promo code wrestle for just $5 shipping, but they'll do it for free. Yeah. Just use that promo code wrestling and get it free. Pay your $5 shipping, man, but you can't beat that. Uh, get it. You can't beat that blue you, chew. <laughs> get it. You won't have to beat it. Somebody else will take care of that for you. There you well, go. What do you think of tomato face thing? I don't like tomato face sting. I like crow sting. 
Hell, I like I like multicolored sting, but not a big fan of tomato face sting. Me neither. Um, crow sting or surfer sting? Which did you prefer? Uh, I always like surfer sting. If he would have came over to the WWF. And the ultimate warrior would have came to WCW. So let's just pretend that warrior stays in mid South. And then eventually, um, the UWF sells to Crockett. So the warrior winds up there. Um, sting instead comes over and winds up becoming intercontinental champion and has a bit of a feud with Rick rude. Would sting versus Hogan at WrestleMania six. Would that have worked? What would that Absolutely. Like? Yes, it definitely would have worked. And it does well, feel like it would have been a, an easier transition into the sort of Bret Hart era, right? Yeah, I just think it would have been a lot different. And I think that the, the talent willing to work with Sting and, and put him over in that, in that way, I think that the build would have been a whole hell of a lot different and, uh, the longevity, uh, you, you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have had as many controversies. Let's say that with sting. So there's a replay from earlier tonight, Goldberg destroying Scott hall. We're almost to our main event. Are you ready? I'm ready. Uh, it, it really was sort of a, a one match show. Uh, I'm looking forward to this one though. Well, again, you've got for WCW right now, the two hottest acts that they've got, you've got Hollywood Hulk Hogan, the stalwart, the, the NWO really. All right. In Hogan. And then you've got the new kid who is coming along that is undefeated. That has captivated this audience. They have a new hero to love. That's theirs that they made. The audience felt like, you know, they made Goldberg, which they did. So he's their guy. And now beautiful to do it in Atlanta, do it at home in front of this giant crowd. And he's a God and he played at Georgia and he's a former Falcon. I mean, it's perfect fucking timing. It is. And I would have waited. But Hey, I also understand Eric's rationale for why your television company go for the TV ratings and go for the best television show. So Goldberg's, uh, walk sure as hell expanded from walking with Doug Dillinger and one other cop. Well, other cops are going to join in and other security guards, but this is the Georgia dome. So it's a ridiculously long walk. And you'll see as they continue here, the entourage grows. We've got, yep. There they go. Just a, well, it's always been sort of funny for me too. I understand what, what they're trying to do is sort of mimic the big fight feel of a Mike Tyson boxing event. My, uh, you know, Tyson had just gotten out of prison a couple of years prior to this, came back, knocked out Peter McNeely. Uh, and, and then you know, it was off to the races again as a pay-per-view draw, drawing huge numbers against the Vander Holyfield. Even when he bit him, it was still big numbers and everything Tyson did. So this sort of backstage walk and feel is borrowed from that, but it is a little funny in that, you know, here's what we've been led to believe is the world's biggest badass, but he's got to have 38 guys walking backstage. Yeah, and then they just left him down this lonely hallway where he could be jumped at any time. At any time. And the worst fucking lighting in the world. Because that's the legit fucking entrance, which is kind of fun. And you see, there's the old, uh, what they call the Jody position. Uh, for Jody Hamilton, of course, we know it here on this show is the gorilla position. And here's that badass entrance once again. Tuck Dillinger's already out there with all the cops. Yeah, I'm pretty sure if Goldberg had it all to do over again, he would prefer probably not to have all that shit blown in his face and uh, inhaled into his lungs. Yeah, it was always a cool look as a kid, though, because you could see him breathing the smoke out of his nose or exhaling the smoke out. like He looks like a fucking badass bull or something. But yeah, you're right. Not There you go. 
probably not the most, uh, health conscious decision, but it was a cool visual, but you know what? He shook it off. Just like those Scott Hall punches the deal with, <laughs> I'm, I'm breathing a bunch Who's of toxins. hitting him because he's shaking his head now. Yeah. <laughs> shit. Wait a minute. It's the Hang on, Bill. <laughs> oh my God. That, t- that tickles <laughs> you, didn't it? It did. Yes. Like, Hang on, man. You're on the, it, okay. Now that pisses me off. Throwing the U S belt down Throwing the fucking championship. Not only throwing it, but throwing it at the feet of Charles Robinson, who probably looked at Penzer and said, look at this fucking guy. He's been here 10 months. He's just throwing shit at me. Well, I can understand that. By the way, Charles Robinson, one of the unsung heroes in wrestling, the dude was in the ring for so many big moments in wrestling. You know, it's Flair's last match, Sean's last match. Uh, edges last match, you know, this title change, there's just so many big moments in history. And he was the third guy there. Uh, and he just recently made the news. I don't know if you saw, but apparently somebody stole a bunch of his collectibles out of his storage unit. No. Yeah. He had like a $70,000 loss or some substantial amount. Cause he collects all this rare old, like movie and horror memorabilia and some other stuff, evil can evil stuff. Well, they found a way to compromise the actual security facility, not his lock. His lock was fine and sneak in and just had their way with his shit. And it's gone now. That sucks. And one of the great guys in in the business too, if you ever have a chance to meet Charles Robinson, he'll have a lot of time for you. Good dude. Wrestling fan. Like everybody listening to this, but he won't listen to our podcast. By the way, he says it's too freaking long. Well, you know what? I'm going to have to have a little chat with him next week. Please do. Uh, When he does listen, it it takes me a freaking week to finish one. Well, well, thank you. That's kind of the idea. We we drop one a week for a reason. And and there you see, man, that's the most Hogan thing ever tearing a t-shirt off and then cup of the year. Good guy, bad guy, whatever. You're going to get what you paid for. But what the hell is he wearing on his head? It's like a sock in the back and shit. No, it's just a, a do rag. He just doesn't have it tied up. It's a bandana they were selling at the merch stand. He just didn't tuck it in at the back. Somebody should have though. I'm with you. He looked like a sock monkey. Yeah. It looks like he was just wearing a. Here we go. Yeah, They're going to ring the bell and look at the crowd. Ding, ding, ding. Security's having to tell him to sit down because they don't want to. They are here and they are ready for this. I'll never forget where I was. I was in Panama city beach on vacation with my parents. Uh, I'm only 16 when this one's going down. I guess I just turned 17. Uh, I'm fired up for this. I mean, I, I was, I was probably more of a raw fan, uh, but I knew it was a tape show. So I sort of had read what was going to happen, but when it came time for the main event and I had to pick mankind or undertaker for the number one contendership and I already knew the result or this one. I'm watching this and I want you to, you know, I said earlier when we watched the Scott Hall match, when you see, oh, he's going to wrestle Scott Hall and he's going to wrestle Hulk Hogan. Ah, Scott will have the better match out of him. Dude. Hogan gave him a great match here. Hogan's a pro. Hogan was out there to do one thing. Hogan was out there to get that big bastard over and to look good doing it. And Hogan was going to make Goldberg beat somebody. And it's Hulk Hogan going out there and look at the tan on Hulk Hogan. God damn. That's a championship tan right there. Oh, Jesus. You've been hanging out with Eric again. I can tell. No, it's a championship tan. The man looks like a fucking world champion. I want to fucking punch you right now. Why? Because we talked about the Starcade 97 finish where they decided not to just let sting win clean and they want to do the fast count, but that was fucked by Nick Patrick because Hulk Hogan told him to. And. Anyway, the gist is when I'm like, Eric, why did you do this? And he says, well, sting wasn't ready. And I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, well, he wasn't tan. And the idea that you have an 18 month build for a pay-per-view and you don't pull it off the way you should, because the motherfucker's not tan when he's been, well, in- you know what? He should have gotten a tanny bed. Well, why didn't we just send somebody down to the goddamn Walgreens and get some self tanner, by the way, how's he going to get tan? If he's got kabuki paint on and he's wearing a fucking leather jacket and he's in the goddamn ceiling for 18 months. Look, we know (laughs) the arms aren't tan brother. Gotta be tan. 
Well, even Sha- Goldberg's got a, a tint of tan. I think Not Goldberg's us. got high blood pressure. That's what Goldberg's oh, got. Oh, there you go. <laughs> That's what it is. How much shit's Goldberg on here? I know you don't like to talk about that, but come on. Goldberg's on some shit here. Goldberg's a goddamn athlete. I'm not arguing He's that. A monster. He's on some shit. He's 31 here, by the way. So 10 months into your wrestling career and you're 31 and you're about to beat Hulk Hogan in front of the biggest WCW crowd ever. And the most watched cable wrestling match ever. I would say his wrestling career was off to a good start, but, but yeah, you know, here, here you are. And you're looking at again, the psychology of the match and look at the pacing. The pacing is Hulk setting the pace. Yes. And Hulk is laying it out as simple as it can be to where everybody at home. Oh, shake it off. Everybody Bill. Shake in it off, arena. Bill. Up. Shake it yeah, off, Bill. Yeah. Shake it off, Bill. That's what you do. So uh, here, here's what's interesting. That I, as a fan, and of course this is silly, but I'm like, why are they not calling a DQ? He just hit him with his belt. But they don't. And then Goldberg wrestles it away and throws it away. And Bobby Heenan explains he didn't want to use it because he didn't want the referee to call a DQ or to accidentally hit the referee and call a DQ. Well, it was a part of Hogan's gear. Sure. So that was okay. Then can't wait for you to defend what's about to happen in a minute. Oh, look at old new Japan Hulk Hogan. there, doing some moves. Oh, a full Nelson. How about that? Somebody had to show him that. Yeah. He's not sure what to do. From here. <laughs> Hogan knows though. Hit him in the dick. Shake your head, Bill. Wait, here we go. Shake it off. There there shake go. it off. Shake it off. Shake it off. Come on, shake it off, Bill. There you go. I don't know, man. Maybe some guys, when they get hit, they just shake their head. Well, I mean, he's doing it a lot. I think one day if it comes out that Goldberg does have some sort of head trauma, God forbid, people are going to assume it's the locker. You know, he would hit himself with his head against the locker. Like you talked about earlier. It might be just all this selling, shaking your head all the time. Yeah, it could be. I'm being a smart ass. Of course, a hell of a clothesline a moment ago by Hogan. And you're exactly right. He's setting the pace, chasing him with elbows. This is a good spot. Yeah. And bill, and but also bills taking his time here. You know, I, I feel like, uh, and that's not the same clothesline he's given everybody else. I love that Goldberg knew how to give a Hogan clothesline. You know, it is, um, it is like an old timer thing in wrestling. Like I've heard people talk about the first time they wrestled Terry Funk, where he would say, slow down. And when you think you're going too slow, slow down some more. Exactly. Tell everybody, why that is, Tell everybody why that is. Well, again, you got to give the audience time to absorb what the hell you're doing and you want that reaction. So if you go so fast that you're on to the next thing, the audience hasn't had time to react and respond and absorb what you just did. Yeah. They've got to, now they're they, watching you doing something else. They've got to be able to process it and react. And then you move on to the next thing. But if they're all together, you know, it, it looks like a run on sentence as opposed to commas and exclamation points. Yeah. And again, Hogan here. The master. And that's why I laugh when people say, well, Hulk Hogan, well, he wasn't a great worker. Folks, watch this match and see how great of a worker right. Hulk Hogan is. Is this part is. of his gear? Is this part of his gear right here? Because they don't call for the bell. They're not calling for a DQ. They're on the outside of the ring and he's being <laughs> born, for God's sake. I, love I you. can't explain these chicken shit WCW rules. It's bullshit, Conrad. Thank you. Referee Earl Hebner would have been called a DQ. Oh, hell yeah. That load went up, kicked the arm out. The le- This is over. This is over. Hogan's well, dropped the leg. It's over. But here's the deal though, brother. He didn't hit the big boot. So you got to go big boot first. He did body slam. And then, but how about Goldberg actually selling the leg drops? Oh, and Kurt's here for backup. By the way, Kurt is going to be the person who winds up facing Goldberg on pay-per-view in six days. It'll be Goldberg's first title defense. 
And this is why, but we missed the pinning combination, but he kicks out. So I kicked out of a Hogan leg drop and Hogan can't believe it. Oh, oh hell. Hey, now that should be a disqualification diamond cutter for your troubles. And look at the crowd ready for this. Just need Hogan to turn around and here we turn go around, turn around. Look at the crowd, dude. Look at that. And they just know it. Everybody does. It, you know what everybody's waiting for? The NWO right to run in. The swerve, bro. Yeah, they're waiting for the NWO to run in. And everybody's looking that way. And everybody's got their hands on their head. Like, no, this isn't really going to happen. But look at the arms go up when he goes up. One, One two, two, three. three. Biggest star in WCW now. There he is. Look at the crowd going nuts. It's there. Steve Austin. Is it not? Yes. Yes, it is. And I, you know, I give them to him. That was done correctly. And you look at that audience. They're going banana. As Pat Patterson was even, even the security guards who aren't supposed to have any emotion are laughing and going, yeah, way to go, Bill. Yeah. The goal, the, the security guards are not supposed to be watching the show. They're supposed to be watching right. the people, but they're turned around like, holy shit. Look at this. And there's the big fireworks display. It's happening. He's unified the titles. Of course, there's going to be a tournament for that U S title. He is your new world champion, the face of WCW. They finally got someone to counterbalance what the WWF was doing with Steve Austin. And it just so happens to be a bald headed guy with a goatee, black trunks and black boots. Coincidence. Yeah. That's real original. Great. You know, this is the first time I've ever seen this show all the way through. They had their hiccups, their shit, but looking at it overall, great presentation, uh, right way to end that night, right finish and the match. And again, I, I will go back and I will reiterate to those that want to say, Oh, Hulk Hogan doesn't know how to work. Hulk Hogan just showed what a great worker he was by putting that match on and getting Bill Goldberg over to that extent and saying, here's your new guy and anointing their next big thing. Let me make the comparison again. And it annoys everybody when I do Goldberg is WCW's ultimate warrior. What did the end of WrestleMania six look like? Exactly. At WrestleMania six, it's over. And you've got your new champion who maybe doesn't have the best promos. Maybe doesn't have the best matches, but Lord, he has a connection with that crowd. He's standing in the corner with sort of the, the underneath belt and the top belt, your one and two titles all by his lonesome. And here we are here, the biggest WCW show ever, same result. What was in common Hulk Hogan. Can't take it away from him. Nope. And that's how we're going to end it. He's going to, going to get a shot of him coming up the ramp. One more, uh, piece of pyro, one more, uh, one more grand finale with the fireworks. The fans are just hanging out, man. Normally everybody's heading, uh, you know, racing to get out of there and beat the traffic. Not the case here. They just want to take it in. This is a moment in wrestling history, a huge one, the most watched match in cable history. And that's how we're going to go off the air. Meanwhile, Bruce on this day, you guys were presenting a, uh, a DQ with the undertaker and mankind for a number one contendership. Uh, the nation of domination was parodied by DX and there was brawl for all. Can't blame me for brawl for all, man. I'm not blaming you for any of it, but clearly nitro had the better show. And I can't believe you're even willing to admit that. Or are you? Well, we didn't look at our show yet, so I'm, I'm not going to admit that. Will I, will I admit that that show was a good show? Yes, I will. And I think that that was a hell of a presentation and being able to look at and watch it all these years later, say that it'll still hold up. Yeah. I'll give that one to him too. I think that that was a damn good show and they put their best foot forward and if they won, then they deserve to win because that was a good show. And, and again, I don't know how, how our show was <laughs> at that point. Um, but that was a good show and that one would be a hard one to, to compete against. And, you gotta, you gotta give the devil that's due. 
go out of your way to find a way to watch this main event and relive it this weekend. If you didn't do the whole watch along with us, go watch Hogan and Goldberg in the main event. And I would recommend that you check out the Chris Jericho stuff. I thought the Jericho stuff with Malenko was really, really well done. Uh, but this was fun, man. I've never, you know, got to sit you down and watch a full nitro like this before. Uh, what do you think? Was this a fun experiment for you? It was, it, it was actually uh, a lot more fun than I thought it would be because I'm sitting there thinking, Jesus Christ, I, other than the very first nitro ever, I can't tell you that I've ever sat down and watched an entire nitro. So yeah, that was an awful lot of fun to be able to go back and relive that and see that, see and feel that energy of Goldberg and, and people, we like to make fun of Bill and we like to talk about, well, his lack of skills here, his lack of skills there. Son of a bitch was over. Uh, he got over and was able to break through all that other bullshit. So yes, um, good shit. And I can't, I, 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 I enjoyed it. Boy, that was tough for you to say, but I appreciate you trying to power through and I enjoyed it too. And we hope you guys are enjoying what we're doing here on the program. We've got lots more fun stuff coming your way. Uh, we're going to have uh, Jim Ross fully loaded 99, 20 years of Jericho, SummerSlam 04, SummerSlam 99, SummerSlam 89. Uh, there's no telling uh, what's next, but stay tuned. We appreciate your support every single Friday at noon right here on something to wrestle with. Bruce. I was supposed to say Bruce Pritchard first. Oh, wait, then I say Bruce Pritchard. No, I say Shaka Khan. Why don't you do it? And then I'll say Shaka Khan. Okay. You got to say something to wrestle with again, then. No, no, you do the whole thing, and then I'll do Shaka Khan. Okay. Something to wrestle with Bruce Pritchard. Shaka Khan. I think I did that better. Maybe. We'll try it next week. <laughs>